Awesome, okay. awesome. We are now recording. Welcome. Stephen, do <laughs> you want to kick us off? <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. Uh, th thanks, thanks very much for, uh, for jo joining us tonight. Very excited to be here. Uh, as you know, um, you know, we're part of the Meetup Madness group. We're a bunch of volunteers that help put together um, a whole bunch of these cra crazy style events, which are normally like V meetups and debates and awesome some other events like beer ops. Well, tonight's going to be a little bit different. Uh, we're doing our first far fireside series uh, on the uh, using some wonderful examples of some emerging tech leadership in front of us here. Uh, so. What we might do first of all, um, I'm sure that you know about you know Meetup Madness. We've got we've got a whole heap of groups um, in the emerging techs. We've got uh, groups in the data space, the automation space, the security space, um, increasing amounts of goodness coming in from uh, blockchain and from AI, etc. Uh, so I hope that you've been enjoying that. If you haven't heard of us, look up meetupmadness.ai. Sorry, AI. I'm getting well and truly into the swing of things here. Meetupmadness.io. And uh, you can check out some of the events that we're putting together. Okay, what I um, what I might do is just to um, we we have two or three people that are joining us today um, who are part of the event sponsors. So we we love these guys. You know, without their help, uh, it wouldn't be possible for us to you know to have the platforms to be able to bring these events to you. So we're really really grateful. Um, they've, there's some awesome technology, but I probably shouldn't spout on too much about that. I think we've got uh, Joey is in the audience there somewhere. Maybe jo Joey from Linode. Uh, I've heard rumors that you guys are awesome. Maybe you can confirm or deny this. Uh, yeah, we are pretty awesome. <laughs> Good. Thank you for coming. <laughs> well, please tell us something about Linode. Uh, yeah, so thank you for the introduction, Stephen. So, uh, Linode, we're actually a cloud infrastructure provider, um, and we've actually been supporting the growing developer and SMB community here in Australia, Australia for quite a bit of time. Um, even from our early days, Australia was one of always one of our largest uh, user communities. And then um, I think last year we decided to kind of take the next step and invest in this region by opening up a new local Sydney data center. Um, and we did this because we know that uh, every workload is very different um, and there could be a lot of uh, resource constraints or, you know, regulatory requirements that could hinder a lot of users in the area. So it's just a lot easier to run a lot of workloads closer to home. Um, and hopefully by doing so, we could offer customers a chance to, uh, you know, get access to cloud hosting that's more affordable or easy to use. Uh, lower latency, um, you know, getting more performance gains or what have you. Um, and in addition to that, we know that the technology or just the tech community in general is growing uh, at a rapid pace in Australia. So we wanted to kind of grow alongside with everyone here uh, and hopefully provide a, a, an open campus so that everyone can uh, accelerate innovation or just get access to cloud computing that's more easy to use or affordable, essentially. Um, so today we're kind of here as a partner. Um, I know that one of our team members, Jamie, she's going to be dropping a link down below. Um, it's going to have an act, uh, a link to our uh, Madness landing page that we created, uh, as well as like a special offer for anyone out there that wants to try us out. Um, if they're interested in, you know, cloud hosting, uh, you're more than welcome to join us uh, and reach out as well. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me as well. Cool. Oh, so I think Jamie's hanging out on the chat channel. There, there may be some secret codes that you guys have put together for extra additional added awesomeness. <laughs> right, right, yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Joey. So uh, you, Joey. Uh, over to Jasper uh, from yeah. Infoblox. We got Jasper? Yes, thanks, thanks for the intro. Uh, Stephen, we're very pleased to be here. <laughs> Um, so, uh, my name is Jasper, I'm the lead solutions architect for Infoblox in ANZ um, and we're really pleased to be part of this meetup as mentioned. Um, just a bit about the company, we're about 20 years old, we're a 20 year old tech company actually, um, but a market lead tech company with about 54% market share in the what's called a, a DDI space, which is a DNS, DHCP and IP address management. Um, it's a bit of a company that kind of flies under the radar, but actually we service you know, the, the top companies in the world and particularly in Australia as well. You know, just think about all the large enterprises, the banks, governments, and so forth. 
Um, and so what we really do the, lately is, is specialize a lot in DNS security, you know, having that heritage in DNS. And uh, what we find interesting is uh, as the security landscape has shifted, we, sh we actually put a lot of effort into AI or artificial intelligence. And we find that really important in the security space. Um, moving along though to, you know, DevSecOps or Sec DevOps, as Stephen usually puts it, <laughs> we find that that's really important. And personally, I find it important. Um, the customers that I meet, um, it's, it's evidently clear that we're moving into this uh, area of you know, infrastructure as code or even doing anything as code. Um, so we ourselves have a, a, a huge play in Kubernetes and a lot of containerizations in our technologies. Uh, and so that's why we're kind of here to see that sort of um, blend between um, the DNS security space with AI, machine learning, uh, as well as you know, set DevOps. So we're here to answer um, any questions you have around, um, around that space. Um, if you want to know more, you can hit our webpage at uh, infoblocks.com or, or email any of the organizers here and they'll pass it off to us. Awesome. Thank you, Jesper. Uh, <laughs> I think we've got um, the lovely Anjali from um, Instacluster. Enlighten us why you got you, you guys are repeat offenders. You, you've sponsored a few of these events before, but maybe there might be some people that are not familiar with you. If you can just give us an overview of what you guys are all about. Okay, so my name is Anjali and I look after the ecosystem marketing and Instacluster is an open source company. Uh, you know, we deliver reliability at scale with open source technologies like Cassandra, Kafka, Elasticsearch, Spark, Redis. Uh, we provide a range of managed service, export, expert support and consulting services to our customer to help them develop and deploy the solution around these technologies. Uh, we have an integrated managed platform of data layer technologies and it's available on cloud, it's available on prem. Uh, and it, you know, that's a platform our customers can use to help their next generation application. Uh, we are, uh, you know, an uh, Australian-based company, so we founded in 2012 in Canberra, uh, but now we're headquartered in the U.S. with over 100 employees across four offices, and we have around 300 customers globally. How can we help? Okay, so we can help you with the production grade cluster in minute. Uh, we can just reduce, you know, your DevOps time and accelerate your time to market. Uh, our single platform is actually a ready-made capability that you can use for getting one vendor for all those complex technology and you can use you know, all the time and money uh, and focus on your solution. There's an expert operational and code level software for your critical software and being a pure open source technologies, you're free from any of the vendor lock-ins. Okay. So feel free to get in touch with us in case you need someone to take care of your entire data layer, you know, uh, bandwidth. And then uh, we are the sponsor and we are like really happy to be here. And uh, one thing we have is you can anytime sign up on your console. On our console, we have a 30 days free trial. I can, you know, add the link to that in the chat box. Yep, nice to be here. Welcome, thank, thank you, Anjali. Uh, I might just hand over to uh, Gerhardt just to r run through the agenda and the platform etiquette and associated stuff. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, so uh, everybody, uh, so first of all, code of conduct, uh, just be reasonable, I guess. Like uh, we're here to have a good time. We're here to have um, inspiring conversations, asking questions is fine. Just be mindful and courteous of each other when you're doing so. Um, the chat channel is there for everybody to use and communicate with each other. So feel free to use it um, and, and please uh, communicate respectfully. Um, if you want to ask a question, we absolutely encourage you to ask questions. Um, if you could please use the Q&A feature in Zoom instead of the chat for those questions. The chat is for communicating with each other. The Q&A is where I will review the questions. Um, when you ask a question, if you could please direct the question to which speaker you would like to answer the question. We can't get every speaker to answer every question, otherwise it would take too long and we can't get through as many questions. So please narrow down your selection to the person you'd like to answer the question, what the question is, um, and 
please state your name as well. So that way we can say um, uh, whoever it is, is asking a question to so forth, etc. cetera. So um, you can pile on the questions on the Q&A, as many questions as you like. I will go through them all and select as many as we can get through tonight. Um, I can't guarantee that we'll get through them all, but please uh, we put them in. We'll try our best. Um, the agenda, part one, we're going to ask the panelists a few set questions, um, which three set questions each. After that, we're handing it over to uh, you all as part two. So please start loading up the Q&A. So um, without further ado, let's get cracking. I think just one, uh, one last little bit in there. We do uh, try to encourage a recruitment stand up at um, every one of our events. It's definitely beneficial for, uh, for the community out there. So if anybody is actually looking for a next gig just now, um, feel free to respectfully post your uh, LinkedIn URL um, into, the, um, into the chat box. I know that there's one or two sharp recruiters um, in, in the audience that you can maybe touch base with um, as Mita, I think, may, may be out there. Uh, she's certainly a jo jolly helpful person, as is Gerhardt, I was going to say, from time to time. <laughs> okay, moving on. Uh, so what, what we'll do now to our awesome panelists, I'm just going to ask you a, a series of three, of three questions, and we'll just go round each of you for each of those questions in turn. So maybe uh, if we can start with uh, Davinia, um, the, what, what we'll do... Uh, if you can just basically give an um, introduction, uh, who, who you are, your area, and um, any trends that the audience might find quite sort of useful, if you can maybe start off with that, Davinia. Okay, yep. Yeah. So, hi everyone, I'm, um, I'm Davinia. Um, so, my um, area of um, expertise is um, data and um, analytics. Um, and in terms of um, some trends um, that we're seeing um, at the moment um, is around um, responsible AI in data. So in terms of machine learning and natural language um, processing, um, especially within the current um, pandemic, um, there's a lot of um, machine learning going on to mine the data related to the pandemic to try and um, identify um, insights um, that can be useful. And obviously a lot of the research that is going on is um, is um, data-based, collating data from um, around the world. So that's quite pertinent at the moment. Um, in addition to um, aug augmented data management, and by that I mean, again, using machine learning um, techniques to improve the way we manage um, data. And then from um, a visualization point of view, we're seeing um, a shift, if you like, um, from um, from predefined dashboards to um, dynamic data stories, um, especially streaming of information. So for example, if you go onto the tablet, a Tableau um, public site, you will see um, a lot of COVID-19 dashboards which stream data as it's being shared around the world, um, which um, you can see the latest um, obviously trends and stats for different countries and for different areas. Um, so there's definitely quite a shift away from, you know, your bog standard um, dashboards into more streaming um, of, um, of data. Awesome. Thank you, Davinia. Uh, same, same question again. Uh, to, oh, sorry. After, well done, Gerhard. Um, after each of our uh, awesome panelists, what we're going to do is just run a, a very quick poll. And what we'll do is we'll wait until at least um, half of you have um, answered that before we move on. So if you can just uh, give us your, your feedback on that poll, that would be awesome. And then we'll crack on to, to Dennis. Gerhard, you'll need to give me some feedback on the best, the best point to move on once we've got a few responses back. Yeah, we can move on to, the next, uh, to Dennis. We can move on. Excellent. All right, Dennis, uh, can you get, give us a quick, quick introduction, your area uh, of speciality and also any trends that you're seeing? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen and, and Gerard. Um, so my area is in the, in the space of AI. I've been in this field for almost two decades. I, I get to tout a, 
a career long stint in this space. And um, I thought it worth clarifying early on first, the, the perhaps misconception that some people have between AI and the terms machine learning or ML um, around um, language technology, around vision, et cetera. And, and sort of the, the, the term that's used for AI is a, is a banner or an umbrella term with a bunch of other sort of sub terms or sub fields of AI within that area. Um, so we have things like machine learning, which, which uh, has a whole bunch of uh, different techniques and approaches to processing data, as, as was mentioned by Davinia. Um, and, and that actually underpins a whole bunch of things, like some natural language processing is underpinned by machine learning. Um, a lot of the speech related activities, so speech recognition and speech generation, uh, voice biometrics, that's all underpinned by machine learning as well. And then when you go to vision, it's kind of like a different data set, but again, uh, underpinned by machine learning. So, so you will see quite often the, the term machine learning used interchangeably with AI, but not all A forms of AI are machine learning. So it's just worth noting that first um, in that area. And so my, my background's actually been in the, this, the area of language technologies. Um, I've studied the area early 2000s as part of my, my career. Um, and I actually wrote my thesis on conversational design for the university domain, doing AI and conversational systems, natural language processing. Um, I, I scored a scholarship with CSIRO to, to build a TV guide and movie guide, um, which you could call and ask questions about what's on TV, what's in the cinemas. Um, and then I, I spent sort of uh, 12 years working for an organization rolling out uh, voice tech, voice biometric, um, doing natural language processing and NLU uh, and speech rec and voice biometrics as well. So I have a very deep expertise in that area, but a lot of it's underpinned by machine learning. And, and so I've been in this area for quite some time and some interesting trends. And I guess one of the reasons I'm super, super passionate about being in this particular space um, is, is that if you look at the trends on where things used to be, a little while ago, in the 80s, you know, everyone's using computers. In the 90s, the big boom of internet. And if anyone's old enough, they'll remember the dial-up days. Um, you know, in the 2000s, you know, smartphones came out. And, and nowadays, we have a whole bunch of mobile apps to use. But even now, we're sort of looking at the trends. And there's a bit of app fatigue, you know, to download another app to manage your energy bill, download another app to, you know, check into somewhere. Uh, and so a lot of people spend their time, we observe, in messaging places. So... If you ask yourself, you know, how much time do you spend in WhatsApp or Facebook Messenger, or iMessage, et cetera, you'll find that a lot of people or in customers and users spend their time on their mobile devices in messaging channels. So this is sort of a question we ask about, you know, where do we, how do we meet people in the channels they're using now and, and leverage the smarts of AI behind the scenes to that? And there's a whole raft of natural language processing that underpins that. Um, if you've been reading the news, the GPT-3, um, about generating automatic articles. You know, that's, that's a new thing that's coming out in the, in the messaging space as well. Um, but one of the other trends I, I observe is, is sort of around the way that we're interacting with different devices. Um, you know, we still use a keyboard and a mouse, but we're, we've moved towards smartphones and, and uh, tapping on screens and swiping. And there's no shortage of children trying to swipe their TVs uh, mm -hmm. as, as they're growing up. And, um, and for me, and, and this sort of ties into the, the topic of IoT and data as well, is as we start having more wearables, um, how do we start to interact with those particular devices, um, you know, without a screen, without a keyboard, without a mouse? And so, you know, you will have seen already the, the growth of voice, interest in voice for Google Home, Amazon Alexas, in your car, et cetera. So in cases where you're sort of disadvantaged for a keyboard or a screen and, and, and attention span, you know, voice is quite, quite pertinent there. So some of the trends, if you look at the adoption rates of, of the speaker, smart speaker market versus smartphones versus like the internet, you'll see a much faster uptick in that particular area. But uh, sort of coming back to the AI stuff, um, one of the interesting trends uh, you'll see in, in CSIRO slash Data61, they put out a, uh, an AI roadmap report um, back in November 2019, so not too long ago, six months ago. Um, and, and they talked about um, a, a skill shortage in the area of AI. And so I, I do think it's important that um, if you're interested in the AI topic, that you start to look at um, that, you know, bridging the gap of skill shortage. Um, there has been no shortage of tech that has become available, whether it's Google, Amazon, Microsoft, uh, IBM, et cetera, to get on board and, and get tinkering with AI, which was previously unavailable. So I think availability of tech, um, shifting trends in, in the way people engage 
and, and use various devices. I think those are the trends that will set up the, the stage for AI. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. And I think you, you, know, you, you just touched upon the um, intersection with um, IoT and data as well. Mm -hmm. I think that, the, that the, very rarely do you get a complete business solution without actually cr crossing the stream, shall we say. So it's yes. really important to continue attending events like this. So you can stay up to date on the stuff that you, you know, might be useful for you. Excellent. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, over to yourself, Mike, Mike Hamilton, if you can tell us a little, little bit about yourself and um, yeah, your key field and also some, some of the trends that are happening just now. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Michael Hamilton. So I represent a company called Morpheus Analytics as head of research there for the last four years. Um, within blockchain, um, one of the key factors that I really enjoy what brought me, attracted me to it, obviously cryptocurrency plays a big part in the blockchain and the word associated with that, but there's a lot more to it than just that. Um, for me, it's about transparency and accountability when performing business transactions across any industry, for example. Now, what, a lot of my research recently has popped up where a lot of IoT devices within agriculture, especially around Africa, around supply chain management. So some companies over there, and one particular one, it's an Australian company that's um, helping small farmers within the black market not having their goods stolen by the logistics companies or the, the, the truck movers um, for taking it to market. So they can log their, all their information. Let's say they've got bags of wheat, they can log it on the blockchain on this solution and they can make sure it gets to market. It's got 10 bags. They make sure those 10 bags get to market. So if they get stolen, they can also go back to the UN who support them with legal support to make sure that that corruption is removed from the system. So that's one example of blockchain being put to good use for uh, helping farmers in Africa and also other places around the world, um, which, I, which for me, it appeals to me quite a lot. And also being emerging technology, it's really disruptive, right? For good, for good reasons. And um, that's something that's also attracted me to it. But also with what I mentioned with IoT and the volume of data that's on the blockchain too to process trend analysis, you need machine learnings. I need people like Dennis, <laughs> I need people like him. And I talk about that probably more than ever, the national the blockchain itself. It's how to engage with it, with the amount of data that is travelled through it. I'll just give you some information um, that um, around blockchain deals that have occurred in comparison of startups around the world at the moment. So... In 2018 and uh, 2019, there was about 800 to uh, 850 uh, blockchain deals done in comparison to about 1,500 done of, in North America and also about 1,300 deals done in Asia. So that makes up about 50% of um, comparison deals. So that's a pretty big chunk of um, global um, participation in blockchain investment. But when it comes to the actual investment itself, um, I'm seeing about four to three to four billion dollars invested in annual blockchain funding, and that doesn't include all the private figures that are included in some of the studies that I find. So, blockchain um, investment accounts for about 12% of total US startup investment, and it also accounts for about 21% of our Asian investment. So, you can see there there's a decent amount of money being invested in blockchain. So, it's a good field to get into an emerging field, which obviously uh, you'll see with crypto markets also. But um, to show you some of the numbers that I've been seeing recently is that last year, Ripple, which is a cross-border payment system on the blockchain, they raised about $200 million at the end of uh, 2019. So that's really decent funding. Another company that offers a fractional ownership called ProxyCoin, that raised about $100 million at the end of um, 2019. Um, to, to um, get some information or get some engagement with um, selling music and film and television items on the uh, blockchain. Um, and another company um, called Figure also raised about $103 million, um, and that also focuses on uh, leveraging blockchain for AI and analytics to deliver mortgage products to the home, to around the world. So you're seeing some decent amount of investment being um, placed in there, which is pretty impressive at the moment. But when it comes to uh, US and China, they're the ones driving most of the investment, what I'm seeing at the moment. So at the moment, at the end of 2019, the COVID situation did lower the, um, the investment of, into the area. But leading up to that point, there was a lot of, um, I call the new arms race in blockchain. And US and China are, are really uh, leading that at the moment. So yes, that information and all that investment's flowing into Australia. And you probably find a lot of the jobs in Australia would probably be linked 
um, to the investment from overseas for us to get work. But um, we could also talk about that further tonight anyway, about the opportunities and um, make sure you give plenty of uh, Q&A around this uh, subject because it crosses over to everything we do tonight across the other panellists. So ask away and get those questions ready. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I think we've just uh, popped up a little poll onto people's screens. So if you just want to just take one nanosecond and give us a yes, no answer on that, that'd be fantastic. And let's move on to uh, Pratik. If you can, I, I, I'm suspecting that you may be the DevOps automation dude, maybe. <laughs> if you can just give us a clue. Who, who are you? Introduce yourself. What's your field? And, uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, so first of all, yeah, thank you everyone uh, for this beautiful uh, event and thanks Gerhard and Stephen for organizing all of this. Um, so uh, to everybody on the call, hey, my name is Pratik um, and I am um, the Chief Technology Officer at Enabler, which is a Melbourne-based consultancy, uh, consultancy and we uh, specialize in um, DevOps, infrastructure automation, cloud infrastructure and all of that. Um, and I've been, over the past many years, uh, as part of my career, I've been helping organizations adopt this DevOps philosophy um, uh, and helping them embrace cloud uh, by just, you know, building out technology platforms that can enable uh, organizations to deliver uh, value faster to their customers. Now, obviously, as I've said, DevOps and cloud multiple times in that introduction, obviously, I'm representing that area today. So I'll be generally talking about what DevOps is, what cloud is, and things like that. Um, so for, 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 for just to set that baseline, what is cloud and what is DevOps? Um, I think we've seen over the past many years, more and more organizations are moving to moving away from managing physical infrastructure in data centers to just using cloud um, and, you know, just using infrastructure and a past service like Amazon or GCP or, or Google Cloud. Uh, and the reason for that is not just not because you know uh, managing an infrastructure or a data center is difficult, but it's also what it means is you don't need to make that upfront investment with cloud. The promise of the cloud is you can pay on demand while you're still in you know investigation phase or you're still trying to test out what the market is with your idea. And the other aspect of that is with cloud, it's all API driven, it's all automation driven, so you can. Um, create, uh, uh, capture your infrastructure as S code. Like you can write down uh, specs of how your infrastructure should look like and behind the scenes, the cloud API will provision that for you. Now, just to, just to make a, a quick note there, I'm not saying with data centers, you can't do this, but there's a lot of effort you need to spend with data centers if you want to automate to this degree. Now, uh, where in fact, more, many organizations, not all, many organizations are never at that maturity level with infrastructure. Um, now, the second part is what is DevOps? So for me and from my perspective, what DevOps is, it's, it's a collection of practices. It's kind of a philosophy, which at the end of the day, the core value of it is it enables an organization to move at a pace where you can, it reduces your time to market essentially. So if you have an idea today and you have it ready to go tomorrow, with adopting these philosophies, you can just deliver it to your customers as soon as you have that idea built out. Whereas traditionally organizations have to have that challenge, like you need to wait for, um, for an example, like I used to work at an organization where whenever somebody wanted to release something out to their customers, a new idea, they would have to put in a request for getting hardware procured, um, installing in the racks and then configuring it and then building out the application. That was an arduous process, months. We're talking about months, not even days. With this philosophy, um, what it tries to do is it, it, it enables organization to deliver that value to your customers uh, in, like as fast as it can be. Now, it's not just about the pace, it's also about making sure that quality standards, security standards are met. So if you have a certain functionality that needs to go out, like let's say if you're working for a, a financial organization, it's not just you write code and it goes into uh, production, it's available to your customer. You need to make sure that it's compliant, it's secure, it's quality tested and all of that, because nobody would like a failing bank app or a failing uh, you know, accounting app uh, where customers are just outraged. So that is what crux of DevOps is. Um, now, why these two things are important for any organization or even in the startup world, it's because it, it lets you um, respond to trends in, this, uh, in, in the industry or it lets you respond to your customer demand. So let's say if your customer are asking for feature X 
And if it takes you six months to deliver that feature today in this age today, by the time you push it out to you know, customers, they will be over it and they might not even want it. So it's very hard to have that. It's very important to have that competitive advantage. And that's why there's a lot of push by organizations new and old um, to adopt this DevOps philosophy, to adopt cloud, to embrace cloud, to move at that pace. Um, now, speaking about pen trends, um, um, something that I've, I've, I've observed, which is very interesting, and it's common knowledge now as well, but more and more organizations now move, uh, want to move to cloud adoption. And cloud it could be any public cloud or Linode, as we have the sponsors today here as well. But something with organizations are moving away from that management uh, data centers. Um, more and more are moving towards public clouds like AWS, Google, or maybe digital oceans or whatever. There are many available. Um, and on the back of that, the organizations today are also moving towards containerized ecosystems. Uh, more and more organizations you will see are adopting a thing called Kubernetes. I'm not sure if all of you or many of you have heard about it or not, but Kubernetes is the new hotness in the tech industry. And frankly, I, 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 I love Kubernetes a lot and I make sure that I bring it up in all conversations. There is so, there is so much passion. I'm so sorry for interrupting. This boy could talk about technology all night. Okay, listen, we've got Q&A. This guy's got lots and lots of answers. Get your questions up on Q&A. Um, so we've got to pull, Pratik, we're going we're to have to move on here. I know you're very enthusiastic about it. <laughs> we're going to come back to you. Though. No, good. Okay, so can we, uh, everybody's now, now got the poll up on the screen. If you just want to click, tick a box, that would be wonderful. And if we can uh, move on to Sarah, you can you tell us who, who you are, what's your area, and what's trending in, I, I'm thinking about two minutes flat. Okay, right. I'll look at. I'm going to say let's see what the time is on my uh, see what the time is on my computer. Um, yeah, hello everyone. My name is Sarah Young. I am a senior program manager um, in Microsoft uh, Azure Security. So unsurprisingly, I do security in the cloud. Uh, the thing that I particularly look at nowadays is Azure Sentinel and doing security monitoring. But um, in my time and for my sins, I have done plenty of cloud security architecture. And um, yeah, that's that's what I do. So I talk to most of our customers now about how to build your security well um, and how you can monitor it and actually have visibility of what's going on because it's really easy to build things in the cloud, but it's really hard to actually make sure you know what's going on as well. Um, so yeah, that's what I do. Um, in terms of trends, I would say, uh, there's always so many things um, and I don't want to throw out too many buzzwords, but let's go for, um, oh, I could say like DevSecOps, I could say guardrails. Um, but I think um, for me, um, as I said, the thing I work on at the moment the most, and I think one of the more pertinent issues, rather than people saying, oh, I need to use cloud. I think most organizations have accepted they need to use cloud in some way, shape or form. Uh, but now it's about, okay, so how do I do cloud well? And how do I know what's going on in my cloud? I think they're the conversations and things that I have the most frequently nowadays. So yeah, I'll leave it there. I'll be quick. I think I'm under two minutes, so. <laughs> awesome, awesome work. Yeah, so Sarah, Sarah again is a repeat offender here. I remember that there's been one or two one or two gentlemen have been up on stage thinking they might know a thing or two more about security than Sarah. They were sadly wrong. <laughs> so again, was, uh, I'm not going to say any more. She's going to get far too big ahead. Uh, just get your questions down in Q&A. You're, you're in really good hands with her. Okay. Um, speaking in really good hands of, if we can move on to uh, Danny, if you can just let us know who you are, what your area are, and what's happening. Yeah, no worries. And I'll follow on with uh, something brief following um, Sarah. So uh, good job. Can you hear me okay? Hey, there we go. Back. Awesome. Oh. Cool. Sorry, worst time for my internet to be rubbish. Um, so I'm, I'm Danielle Story. I'm the CTO at a company called Psychic. Uh, we do IoT and smart city system integration. Um, historically, I've, I've been an architect and engineer and sort of, I guess, worked my way up into a CTO role. Um, Became fascinated with IoT because I kept leaving my garage door open and I wanted to fix that problem for myself. And here we are now connecting street lights and managing cities efficiently um, five years on. So that, that's sort of um, 
who I am, what I do, um, get to solve some really cool problems um, in our cities. Uh, and it certainly keeps me interested. Um, absolutely though, all of the areas that we've talked about um, absolutely relate to IoT, be it cloud, be it analytics of data, machine learning, like they all kind of intersect quite heavily um, in different areas and of course security and blockchain as well. So uh, in terms of trends, I think the really obvious one for me is there is more and more things being connected to the internet that aren't necessarily computers or smartphones. Um, I couldn't tell you how many devices I've got in my house these days. Um, and also using those things with voice. Um, so I can't say her name because she's with an earshot, but uh, my uh, assistant at home, um, she turns my lights on, boils my kettle, all sorts of stuff. It's very lazy, but I absolutely love it. And I don't know how I lived without it. Um, and uh, in terms of other trends, I suppose we're seeing in the um, enterprise and in government space, IoT being used to try and make things more efficient, to save money, or to sort of address sustainability initiatives. In my household, it's because I'm lazy and I don't want to get off the couch to boil the kettle. So um, I'll leave it there and I'm sure we can get into the more detail later on, but thanks for having me. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Danny. I think there's definitely going to be uh, maybe a few questions coming, uh, coming in around the overlap between your field and Sarah's field as well from like a security perspective, very important. Okay, we have, we have another quick poll uh, up on the screen. Whilst you are clicking that button, uh, I could embarrass uh, Danny by saying that I actually consulted around quite, quite a few um, industry speakers in the IoT space and I asked them for recommendations and there seemed to be like a common thread all going up to sort of Briz Vegas and we're staring at her right now. So it's, it's really good that you've chosen to come and join us and share some of your time with us uh, tonight, Danny. Um, likewise, uh, to a bit of a legend um, as well, uh, Mr. Pete Cooper, I'm going to embarrass you very slightly. The, as far as the startup um, incubator community goes for this continent of ours, essentially it, it, it's been bootstrapped by this boy, Pete, Pete Cooper. Um, I can't recommend this boy highly enough. Uh, you maybe heard of um, incubators like fish burners and a whole bunch of other start con which i believe is the the largest startups conference in the southern hemisphere that's another one of his um i'm i'm probably not going to say anymore you'll get far too embarrassed pete give us a clue who are you what do you do and what, what are the trends that are happening oh, shut up wallace gosh <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, hi, I'm Pete, Pete Cooper, PC0 on Twitter, um, coming to you from Burma, um, Myanmar. Um, in the, I'm on the northeast side, on the Thailand side, so that's between India and China, originally from Sydney. Uh, a lot of people know me from the hobby that ate my life, which was uh, Sid Start, the conference that became StartCon. Um, and some other things uh, like lobbying politicians and helping build incubators. Um, I'm uh, obsessed with uh, real-time, large-scale real-time technology. So one of the things I'm doing up here is helping with uh, financial inclusion. Uh, so we've just built a wallet, uh, digital wallet, for, and 6 million people have signed up in the first 18 months. Uh, we've just processed their first 100 million transactions. And... Um, I love that innovation at the intersection between entrepreneurship and uh, the endless stream of new enablers that are coming through the technology community like uh, AI and machine learning and data analytics and security and DevOps. Um, just because it's, well, apart from being mind-numbingly hard to keep up with, it's so empowering for the whole world. So, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully we can talk later tonight about um, the opportunities and threats uh, for developing and developed countries. Uh, caused by the pandemic um, because as we all know on the internet no one knows if you're a dog and um, so Myanmar's got 55 million people Australia's got 25 but the GDP per capita difference is about 50x um, Myanmar's probably 50 times poorer um, but they also have no legacy so they can uh, not just leapfrog but double leapfrog and they have an incentive to to almost triple leapfrog to the very very latest technologies um, they had nothing to lose because they're already so far behind. So um, I think I think it's fascinating um, changes happening in the world right now, and I'm I'm just delighted to have, still have roots in Australia and 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 family and um, 
but be in the middle of it up up here. So um, yeah, I, I probably keep it short and, and make one suggestion if you're trying to get a career path or you're looking for resources in, in the industry, um, get connected to the Sydney Startup Hub or get connected to a community uh, or an accelerator program, incubator program. Uh, I like Founder Institute, I love Startmate, uh, they're world class um, and they're, they're, bo they're both very different and check out the resources from Y Combinator I also founded two other little things. One's called the Start Society, which is in Australia and Myanmar and, and planning in a few other countries. And um, uh, something more close to our hearts as opposed to our brains, um, I'll put the link in the website. It's a food bank for starving people in Southeast Asia. So a little, a little plug for a private project. Uh, looking forward to some tough questions, everyone. Bring it on. Awesome. <laughs> Yeah, so I hope that, that you're getting a bit of a flavour there. If you have any have any aspirations of kicking off your own business, if you've got an idea for a startup, um, if you're already part of a startup or whatever, get get those questions rolling. You're in really really good hands with Pete. Uh, so we've got a quick poll up on the screen just now. Are you connected to Startup Ecosystem Hub? If you can just give us uh, your feedback on that, that would be awesome. So what what we'll do now, just to make sure that we're going to stick to time um, ongoing. Uh, if we can try and be as concise as possible, maybe like a minute or so uh, with regards to your answer here. Okay, so we're moving back on to Davinia. Um, and the question is, what is the greatest achievement that you've had in your area? And if you could change just one thing, what would it be? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I've had my greatest achievement in my area. You're working on it. <laughs> um, I, I've, I've certainly got to where I've wanted to be. So I think for me, um, the stepping stone from going from university um, and then starting my career as a as a programmer to where I am now um, is a great achievement. But I, I still think I've probably got more 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 in me. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I would say um, so. Um, yeah. And um, what was the second part of that question? <laughs> well, on your journey to the non-existent greatest achievement, what was one thing that you were going to change? <laughs> one thing that I was going to change. I actually wouldn't change anything of, of, of my journey because each, each um, aspect of my journey, um, I've learned something um, and different challenges have arrived at the right time. So I feel that um, everything's happened for a reason. So I actually wouldn't change anything. Awesome, you're in a good spot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dennis, no, no pressure. Davinia is rocking and rolling there. If we can sure. move on to yourself, Dennis, what's your um, greatest achievement in your area? And if you yes. change just one niggly naggly thing, what, what would it be? I, I think um, spending almost two decades on the one, one topic, um, I feel like uh, now the time has come for AI to be of interest to people. Um, you know, I have won a number of awards for, for projects that I've worked on in the past, including almost being, um, a, a, was a finalist, didn't quite win, uh, was a finalist for the Prime Minister's Award of Excellence um, in, in delivery. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty good accolade. But, um, you know, these days, I, I actually find it more, more rewarding to help others. So I think it was mentioned earlier about doing stuff, but doing it well. I think there's no shortage of um, articles out there on how to do AI, how to use machine learning models, use which platforms, but not many companies or organizations or individuals will do them very well. That includes like um, sort of embedded, embedding and education and the empowering aspects. So for me, I think helping other people on that journey, just sharing those lessons learned, I think is, is the biggest achievement that I'm doing these days. Uh, in terms of change, um, being, being, you know, tech at heart, early adopters of, of those, you know, smart devices as well, I think, um, I, I wish I'd probably focused more on even more on the customer and even more on the business. So if you think, if you think about standard products that are sort of a, a marriage between tech product, uh, tech customer and business, you know, focusing less on tech because tech's always there and it's an enabler and it's constantly growing in leaps and bounds, but focusing relentlessly on the customer and the business. So making sure you put dollars back in the pocket of a business. I think that's the big thing I would change. Awesome. And I think the, you know, the paradigm about, you know, serving others first, I think is, is really, really, really good because it, it does come back and it repays you. This is very much the paradigm of the organizers in Meetup Madness. Uh, we, you know, we offer ge genuine offers of help and you meet so many drongos along the way, but that's okay. 
Yeah, because mm -hmm. you do meet a whole bunch of, of people and specific contacts and it repays you like a hundredfold. It's so, so worth it. Mm -hmm. recommend doing that for everybody. Awesome. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, if we can move on to uh, the veritable Mr. Hamilton, what's your greatest achievement in your area to date? And if you could change just one thing, what would it be? Okay, well, the, well, the achievement, well, private achievement's probably more setting up a private fund for a crypto fund, basically, of four years ago, and um, for family and friends. And then having to drive that fund, I've had to do all the research in the actual industry and expand my mind and learn. <laughs> and the most important thing is to discover how blockchain is changing developed countries probably more and see where it's going to make an impact around the world um, from that perspective. And that's one of the big achievements is learning, okay, and, um, and finding out more information. Um, on, the other side, on the other side of the coin with the second half of the, um, of the question is probably more around basically education, taking that information and sharing that information. I've been doing a lot of that and, and collaborating, uh, especially what we're doing tonight and making sure everyone's learning. I'm finding that we need to get more people understanding alternatives in general, what's available and not to stick into the mainstream. Because I think that's what's I'm noticing in my research is that's a big problem globally, not just in Australia, of course. But, um, but I want to make sure people really start getting down and dirty and understanding what's available to them. And I think in COVID, they've learned a lot of that. And I want to make sure we can continue that. And that's in all technologies and everyone today representing in this panel tonight, for example. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Mike is an awesome living example of, a, of what I like to call a goal giver. He helps the startup community as well, offering so much of his time. So thank you very much for that, Mike. I do appreciate it. Okay, let's go on to um, critique in under half an hour. <laughs> no, I'm only kidding. I'm being respectful. It's <laughs> Warren Snappy. Greatest achievement today. Oh, greatest achievement. One thing. What would it be apart from timekeeping? Let me see if I can keep this short. So yeah, uh, whilst there are uh, many, um, you know, uh, uh, organizations that have helped with the transformation side and we've reduced uh, cycle times to production, I think personally what I find um, is, or I can classify as my uh, achievement is um, in Melbourne, I've been able to help the community uh, grow and learn and adopt this DevOps and cloud philosophy. And I've been running some of the workshops free, of course, obviously for folks who are um, who, who don't have like a who are not privileged or who are looking to change industries. So I've been running those workshops, and that has been my personal achievement because I've seen few folks now starting to get jobs or whatever. Um, what I would change is probably I was very ill prepared for this whole COVID situation. So I haven't had any of these workshops ever since this whole thing hit. So probably if I could change something is, you know, be better equipped with technology platforms like these or be more prepared to, you know, run these e-workshops or remote workshops. That's it. How's that for time? <laughs> <laughs> we did it. We did it. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> and I think this, you know, the, you know, you are a really, really good example of somebody who wants to help just in, in your own time again, Pratik, to be able to give knowledge to others. And I think, um, yeah, you're a really good example of that. Well done. Okay, so we're on to uh, Sarah. Greatest achievement in your area to date? And if you change just one thing, what would it be? Oh, so greatest achievement to date. Oh, I'm going to go for really to choose from. Uh, no, but I'll go for the easy one because why not? Well, I won an award last year for security champion of uh, the year in Australia and the women in security awards. So that was pretty cool. And I didn't think I was going to win that. Like one of my friends actually has a video of me there and I was just drinking my drink and watching and, and she's got, it's a, it's a terrible video, but I'm just like, <laughs> Because genuinely, I, I really was not expecting that. So that was amazing. And I really, because I was up against some other really amazing women. So yeah, I'm still, I mean, it was 10 months ago and I'm still to this day very shocked. Um, uh, one thing I would change. Ooh, that's oh, so many things. Um, um, if there was one thing I would change, you know what? It would be the it would be about security people not about how people react to security because they do think a lot of people in security still like to keep ex security exclusive so they'll say oh you know security or oh, you can't do that or oh, developer oh, 
you won't understand this. This is security. It's very, it's very hard. And that's really not a useful way to be because just because more people are being upskilled in security doesn't mean security professionals' jobs go away. Um, we, it, it is within everyone's interest for us to be more upskilled in security, whether you're a dev or you're an everyday person or, or whatever. And I do think there's a little bit with, with some people in security still a bit of an exclusive mentality. Um, and that doesn't help with where we're going into agile and DevOps and stuff where everybody needs to up their game, but you'll still have some security people like myself or whatever, who, you know, our entire life is, is security. And yeah, we need to stop being so exclusive because we can have more, we can never have enough people in security, in my opinion. Absolutely. So helping to sort of shift the um, shift security left and put an awful lot more responsibility, a bit more that way or whichever way is left. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, okay. Um, on to uh, D Danny. Great, greatest achievement uh, in your area to date. So if you could change one thing, what would it be? Spill the beans. Cool. So um, a similar thing actually. Um, I, I won an award last year, um, which was like the Australian Women of IoT Award. Um, like Sarah, actually, I was not feeling well and I went back to my hotel and people were calling me and were like, you got, you won. And I'm like, okay, cool, great. <laughs> um, so a similar, similar sort of story, you know, there's some great people um, in the industry uh, and some fantastic women out there uh, amongst the suits of men. <laughs> and um, it's really nice to see uh, a few more women representing out there. So um, that, that's been nice. Um, I would actually honestly say though, something that's probably brought me, I guess, more, um, sense of achievement than that than that was um, a lot of our smart city programs now have won national and international awards and absolutely um, seeing your work be recognized um, and your clients getting recognition for that like that that's sort of why why we do what we do um, so that, that's been really awesome um, what would I change um, less so on the technology side but more on starting a business like with no freaking clue why you go and start a business um, People like Pete that are out there who are just willing to help, um, and, and I don't I don't know Pete, but there's there's plenty of Pete like figures that I've come across um, throughout the years that are quite happy to sort of point you in the right direction, and I, I sort of see the same thing in the tech industry as well. So it's awesome, um, you know. Obviously, all the panelists here have, have been doing great things, and it's um it's great for each and every one to to be taking the time out to sort of help those who are on their career path trying to find their way, um, and, and I know. Um, myself included, you know, there's a sense of, um, of uh, you know, giving, giving something back, but also in terms of, um, I guess, helping that next wave of people coming through the industry. So it's awesome. Well done. Lots of awards. What have I been doing with my life? <laughs> and uh, Pete, uh, great, greatest achievement today. I know there's the where we're going to be here for hours. <laughs> and if you could change one, one thing, what would it be? Um, we tried to buy PayPal back in the day and um, didn't try very hard. And I, I took it to the board three times and the bastards didn't agree with me. So I, I sort of have, have a few regrets about that because it would have flipped the whole world. It would have been based out of Sydney instead of the States and 40% of eBay's profits would be coming back here um, or back to Sydney anyway. I'm in, I'm in Burma. Um, yeah, most proud. I, I looked the early days with the stock exchange when we built, we were the first, um, depending on what you, you measured, we were sort of first or second or third in the world with trading on equities and options automated. Um, that was pretty cool. But uh, yeah, even just last year when we did the, the e-wallet for here for Burma, it's called KBZ Pay, if you want to have a look. Um, it's a defensive strategy against um, um, Alipay and WeChat Pay. So we basically photocopied their playbook and um, and translated it into Burmese. And um, you know now now it's the single biggest top up channel for every telco, um, three hundred thousand merchants and agents nationally. Um, and you know people like Shopify are knocking on our door to to um, to integrate. And and um, as I said earlier, you know Myanmar is a bit interesting, and I think there should be a natural long-term alliance between Myanmar and Australia because there's a lot of history there with the Brits here, with, with the Brits being here. But um, just, you know, we've got such strong links with India and China um, and, and we don't have with, with the country right in the middle of the two. So, yeah, it's fascinating uh, getting the tech startup scenes going. Um, what would I change? I probably would have started focusing on ecosystems earlier. Um, the, the the power of the ecosystem, like if you look at Sydney now, I, I think there's something like a quarter of a million jobs in startups. And um, 
we should have started that 10 years ago, not, not 10 years before we did, um, not, not in 2009 or 10, we should have started it. So uh, underestimating the long-term impact of small actions today. So um, hyper-connecting people for peer learning uh, makes the community more resilient. You need dozens of skills to run a startup and, and the best way to do that is through a community um, and connecting with a you know, major hub. Uh, so that's probably what I regret not starting that hobby that ate my life earlier. <laughs> Opportunity of getting in on PayPal. Eh? Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, um, so let's let's move on to the the thir third and final question here. Before we get on to the the audience questions, please do if you've got questions, get them into uh, the question section Q, Q and A. Uh, so we can just give these guys the hard the hardest run. You're going to get the most value for your money. Well, you're not money in this case. Okay, so last question. This is for uh, Davinia. Uh, in your field, what would you recommend as like a good le learning pathway in your field? Um, I think, well, because it's data and data is, <laughs> is in everything, um, I'd say it's, 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 I think you should find which area you're passionate in, in terms of um, degree choice, because there's a lot of different pathways that you can use to get into 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 data. Um, so it could be, uh, you know, uh, a traditional um, business degree, a maths degree, data science, and computer science um, that you're focused on. Because if you're going down the analytics route or data visualization route or coding route, each of those different pathways will will take you there. So I'd say see you know, which of the, the electives is, um, you know, you're most interested in, um, and then go from there. But um, with all things, um, your network is your net worth. So that also is helps you to get connected um, to, you know, get work placements so that you can see which areas um, suit you. Um, I did a work placement as part of my um, degree. Uh, so a uh, one year paid work placement, and that allowed me to, to um, see what I didn't want to do within the data and, uh, and um, analytics field. So that would be my recommendation. Awesome, and there's, there's probably different ways that you can get that uh, experience as well, whether it be through for formal education or going along for volunteering um, yeah. for startups or doing like certifications or something like that. If Emmy's got any or would like to know more about that, please do put, put your question into the q and I know that but Mike Hamilton has got some uh, has got some feelings on uh, on that as well. Okay, thank you, Davinia. All right, move on to uh, Dennis. What do you recommend as good good learning pathway uh, for AI? Yeah. So um, as I mentioned earlier, there are many many different subfields of AI. So it may be maybe hard to choose first. I think um, first and foremost is I guess have a have a growth mindset to to have a a lifelong learning approach and, and in training education. There are so many new tools that are coming out in the AI field. If you are in this space, you're gonna be learning continually. Uh, that's the first point I make. Um, the second one I didn't quite get to touch upon earlier, which was around, I guess, any, any major organization large enough will be undergoing what's called digital transformation. And, and yes, they've been doing it for quite some time with making new websites, making mobile apps, going mobile responsive. But as well as that, um, you know, automation is, is part of that and automation that is intelligent underpinned by AI is a part of that. So it really, uh, for me, I, I kind of tend to ask the question of, you know, are you more tech focused or tech savvy or are you more interested in the business aspects of it first? And then from there, I like to ask people like, you know, if you're, if you're interested in the AI space, start looking at where you work in, in any organization or business or uh, wherever you are ask, you know, what is it we can do to date to start automating? And now automation might be as simple as, you know, a rules-based type thing, a uh, decision tree. But then as, as you dig deeper into that area, you'll start to find ways that you can apply AI. And from there, you can start taking courses. Um, there's a whole plethora of courses on Coursera, uh, Skillshare, et cetera. You know, go pick a course, you can do, a, do a, a digital degree or something in that space. And there's no shortage of articles online about how people have gone out to solve problems. So. I, I, as an engineer at heart, I don't like to see people reinventing the wheel. So do, you know, suss out the market first to see if the problem you're trying to solve has been solved before. If not, um, you know, it's, it's certainly an area to investigate. And if it has been solved before, try and find the best one to apply to your business, whether that's from a tech perspective or a business perspective. Again, lots of self-learning to do out there these days and make it relevant to your business. 
Thanks, thanks, Dennis. Uh, okay, on to uh, Mike, Mike Hamilton. Uh, what's good? Are the good good pathways uh, learning pathways for blockchain? Uh, being so early in the game where it is at the moment, um, I would definitely recommend a certification, a short term certification. Now, there's a like there's a lot of like open source type of projects in the blockchain space that I recommend you look at. Um, being one being look top of mind is Ethereum uh, blockchain. There's a lot of uh, certifications on the internet for that. Um, if you join these projects, you get to contribute the code to those projects and also you get experience you put on your CV, right? But also, if you are looking to participate in these type of projects and do a certification, I do recommend you do join a startup. It's because it's so early days, you're better off getting the experience early as possible being, and collaborating and pioneering with these people around the world. And by doing that, you get the experience, but also focus on the business outcome too. Don't go necessarily into the technology. Understand what the business outcome of what you're trying to achieve with the technology, right? Um, you can still build a normal database um, today without you know, having to use blockchain. So as I mentioned earlier, it's about transparency and accountability in a new world of digital um, uh, transformation. So always have a think about certifications and open projects and contribute your time, you know, do it early. If you're 19 years old, you're in the first year, of school with university, join a startup, maybe once a week, just participate, get that experience. And obviously when you do get that higher experience, go to university too is an opportunity, but earlier on certifications and startups, I recommend that. So it's sounding as if you're sort of, um, you know, you're recommending that people, you know, donate their time again, you know, yeah. just think about, you know, think about the bigger picture, you know, the business goal that you're actually after here and just go for it by lining up with some startups or whatever and volunteer. Definitely. Definitely. I've got some examples from UTS later on I can tell you about too. Yeah. Okay. Uh, skipping straight on to uh, Pratik. Recommended learning pathways for automation. That's going to be a really short, <laughs> short thing. <laughs> uh, yeah. So again, um, as other panelists said, like uh, cloud and DevOps, it underpins many other verticals as well. So there's a wide variety of you know topics of uh, specialization that you can go for. But what I would uh, recommend initially, and certainly this helped me, and so I'll give you what I did as well. Do kind of like an entry level certification in any of the uh, any of the cloud provided certificate lists. So like AWS has one, GCP has one. That will give you a good idea of the broad spectrum of um, you know things you can cover within the the cloud world. Um, and then there are many many open source available playgrounds or learning material that I would heavily encourage everyone to go uh, check out, especially. Um, in the cloud and DevOps ecosystem, there are CTFs that you can just, you know, play around with and not so much to, you know, prove your, um, uh, uh, your, uh, your efficiency with it, but just to identify which areas you like the most or which areas you're lacking skills in. And then the other aspect is, which is the softer side of it, is uh, do uh, look at some of the meetups. Uh, Stephen runs many of the meetups in, in Australia wide. Um, anyway, so do go to those meetups. You will learn a lot from people sharing their experiences. There are many, many conference talks as well. So for instance, if you're interested in cloud and you're interested in, let's say, Kubernetes for one, um, go and look at some of the uh, talks in conferences. That will give you a good idea. And then as I did, I joined a startup very early on in my career, where is where I learned um, all the cloud goodness that I know today. So I encourage people to, you know, just try it out, find a job where you can, you know, actually experience that uh, kind of a thing. Excellent. There's many good, you know, good resources as far as, you know, cloud education, um, automation um, education. I'm sure if Emmy wants to uh, pick, pick your brains, you know, Q&A, Q Q you, know, you know, would be great. I'm sure that Sarah's got some feelings on that one as well. She might be willing to share, <laughs> just maybe. All right, thank, thank you, Pratik. Uh, on to Sarah. What is, in fact, this is, it just flows perfectly. Good le learning pathways for all things and all things cyber. Oh, such a, such a big question. So for, for, for transparency, I have no tertiary qualifications in IT at all. Um, I have a history degree, cool. Uh, so what that means is I can write blog posts really well, awesome. But um, I mean, security is a funny one because 
three, you know, maybe five years ago, there was no such thing as a cybersecurity degree or any kind of courses in the same way. Most people who did security would come into security from other parts of IT or, um, and it wasn't considered such a learning pathway now or specific learning pathway nowadays there's lots of different options out there now um there are plenty of degrees and courses and things like that you can take now i as as you may have gathered have no experience of these personally because they weren't around and i chose arts but i think any kind of technical training is really useful because security permeates throughout all of tech so if you're if you've been a developer or if you've worked in infrastructure or, or whatever it is there will be a security element to that to start you off and for a grounding and um, the thing i say to people is personally i would not recommend particularly if you're starting out um, and i generalize but let's assume you're at the beginning of your career or you might be doing a career transition you probably don't have loads and loads of money to spend on really expensive training and there is a lot of expensive training out there so um, doing a CISSP exam is a couple of thousand dollars just to take the exam um, and I have met people who haven't even started their careers and they've gotten studied for these exams and whilst I think that's incredibly admirable and, and good on you for doing that like take for example the CISSP exam or CISP as I would call it um, CISP you, they won't give you the qualification until you can prove five years worth of experience in security so you know you can spend a lot of money on it but then you still can't actually use the and you could pass the exam but you still wouldn't get the qualification so i think be, be smart like especially whilst you're early on in your career or if you're still looking or maybe if, even if you're in entry level job like be smart and do the things that are like free or cheap because there's plenty of stuff out there so a lot of the big cloud providers uh will do all the basic exams for free there's loads of free material online or you can get cheap deals i know at the moment particularly with everything that's going on in the world quite a lot of providers of learning materials are giving things away for free um or very very cheap so go look at that and then last but not least go out to the community the um you know, there's plenty of open source things that you can help with as well in the security space. And even if you're not a coder or you can't go fix the coding um, on some kind of tool, they even need help with stuff like documentation and just reviewing things. And to me, getting involved in that way is also really, really valuable and, and shows, um, it shows kind of get up and go aptitude. I don't, I don't know what to call it, but you don't have to like try and bankrupt yourself doing it. Of course, if you're in a position, if you're 18 and you're trying to, um, and you're picking a university course, I'm not saying like, don't pick cybersecurity, but um, of course there's lots of people who are interested in transitioning into it post university. So I'd say don't, the answer isn't always to go back and maybe spend tens of thousands of dollars on studying. Just, just keep all your options open. Awesome, thank you, Sarah. Uh, some great, great advice there. On to um, Danny, as far as IoT goes, good, good learning pathways that you can recommend? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of things, it's actually very similar to what Sarah just said. I think a lot of the things, you know, in the IoT space um, come back to common tools like, you know, Microsoft Azure, AWS, those sorts of things. And, and both of those have quite a lot of um, free courses, content, those sorts of things. Um, obviously that applies to cloud and other areas as well, not just IoT. Um, while I'm mentioning that, um, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of really niche IoT players and you can go and do their individual courses and things. But I think, um, you know, if you're looking to upskill, I would go with, um, you know, skills that can be applied at, across multiple domains or skills that can be applied um, to different scenarios. Uh, so but r rather than go and do one, um, you know, proprietary vendors content, I'd start with the foundational stuff first that's kind of broad and then get into the areas you're interested in. Because when we're talking about IoT, um, it's as broad as the ICT industry in that you've got sensors, you've got networks, you've got platforms, you've got integration, you've got, you know, AI, machine learning, data visualization, you've kind of got a whole swagger of things that you could go and learn. Um, if I had to give you one piece of advice right now, there's a couple of really good courses on Coursera and things like that, where it's really broad, but kind of talks about IoT conceptually. What does it mean? Um, what are the bits and pieces that make up IoT? Um, also, when I talk to people, usually they're either interested in the sensors and the electronics or the network or, you know, the, the platform, the integration. 
it really depends what your area of interest is. Um, but, it, you know, if you were looking to just get some general foundational knowledge, I think things like those Coursera courses are, are really helpful. Um, and a non-technical skill that I think is really important um, and something that I always encourage our staff to do is training around design thinking, divergent thinking, um, because, you know, someone said before, if you try and so, you know, solve things the way you've always done it, you, you do it a certain way. Um, and, and there's good opportunities to, uh, to move away from that and think about things differently and solve the right problem as opposed to solving symptoms of a problem. So I, I don't think those hurt. And, and um, you know, even really technical, um, really competent IoT folks, a lot of them can't think laterally. So I think there's, there's some really good, um, I guess, extra skills and canvases and things that you can, you can uh, use to break down and solve problems a bit more creatively. So. That's probably what I'd suggest. So the, yeah, the Coursera stuff, a, a lot of the, you know, AWS, Microsoft broad stuff. Um, and then obviously there's some specifics as well. If people have particular interests, I can point those out a bit later. Awesome. Thank you, Danny. Uh, and on to yourself, Pete. Uh, I'm a, you know, I, I, I'm a newbie that got this cra crazy idea for a startup. You know, how can I learn how to do it? You know, where do I go? Who do I speak to? What, you know, what's your mobile number? If it's if it's your idea, it probably is crazy, but that'd be that's what makes it fun. Um, yeah, look, I think I think um, uh, a lot of people want to hang on to their idea and don't uh, share it. Like the best thing you can do is get it out there and start validating it, um, because uh, you, you may well be just not aware of a lot of other things that are happening, and especially because the industry is so broad now and has so many verticals. Um, you can have competitors coming from so many different dimensions you haven't even thought of. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to obsess about just competition. Uh, you, you really want to obsess about the customer and, and problems and uh, it, particularly in the early days, sort of stay broad to, to listen to all those problems. Um, and then, and then you can prioritize them. And, and, and one of the dimensions you should think about prioritizing them is how fast you can test an experiment to, to validate. And then the other, and there's a, there's a thing called, um, there's a, there's quite a few tools to search for startup validation tools. You'll find about five. Um, and, uh, and, and also prioritize based on passion. So if you keep coming back to the idea, uh, because it's a real problem, um, if you search for Pete Cooper founder Institute, you'll, you'll see my talk on passion and, and it just makes it easier to get out of bed and it makes it easier to find talent and convince people and, and, uh, find the energy to chase things. Um, and then you can even sequence them a bit. So if, if there's groups of customers that are shared uh, across those segments um, and there's, you know, there's, there's sort of diminishing levels of passion or longer term opportunities um, or related problems, uh, that, that's when you get uh, what's called uh, unique customer or unique market insights. So when you get a unique market insights, that's when venture capitalists and investors and smart early, early uh, team members get get very excited because they go oh shit <laughs> that's so obvious once you hear it but it's not obvious until you've discovered it and uh the, the, what i just said probably sounds quite boring and mundane but that's a pattern that i've seen for 15 years and it, it works across technologies it works across um many many ways so uh and so learning pathways uh to, to the short answer is get into the communities so i'll put a whole bunch of links on the chat founder institutes in about 70 countries start mates uh certainly the best we've got in Australia, um, uh, AngelList, uh, angel.co for, for resources and finding investors globally, uh, CB Insights, uh, the CB stands for Crunchbase because they originally started sucking their data out of Crunchbase, which is also a good resource. But CB Insights is a particularly interesting one because they add unique value uh, analytics on top of that. Um, and Y Combinator is the classic uh, um, with, with many online resources. So, um, and, and our humble Start Society, I have to put a plug in for as well, the Start Society. Founder Institute um, uh, took off in Australia only because we'd started fish burners beforehand. And fish burners has become one of the biggest components of the Sydney Startup Hub, uh, which is what, certainly the biggest in Australia. And that in turn has helped drive uh, Sydney Startups, the Facebook group, which is about 20,000 people. I'll put a link on that group. And um, I'm not, like I love a good Sydney versus Melbourne argument. There's nothing more fun in the whole world um, for an Australian. But um, when I promote Sydney first, it's only because 
history has shown us consistently that to build great ecosystems, you need one most dense hub. So in America, it was uh, San Francisco and then, and then sprouted in New York and Los Angeles and Boston and Seattle. Um, in, in the UK, it was very clearly London. Um, and then in Europe, there was a fight between, you know, Paris and um, Berlin and, uh, you know, arguably some of those like Berlin only survived because others had failed like Stockholm. So you, 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 once you've got a great hub, then you can build uh, the, the adjacent hubs. So we, we've you know, run an experiment in Vigo, which is where my cousins live. There's, it's five hours drive from the city to Melbourne and there's, uh, they're aiming at 300 startups in the next 20 years, uh, which sounds like a, 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 an achievable goal, but it's quite ambitious when you've got none. Um, and, and they're well on the way to it. Uh, there's people in the, in the chat from, from quite a few cities. Um, they're, they're popping up all over the country. So uh, I'm not putting down Melbourne. Uh, and and, and uh, if you think about it, Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane have all got uh, health tech clusters that are in the top 20 globally. Um, and fintech, obviously, is, is a, a national pride point for Australia. So, um, yeah, uh, fo focus on the co connecting to the community so you can have the diversity of views and opinions and the shortest path to the resources and talent that you need. So it's like to like engage early. Don't be too afraid. Don't you know? Don't don't hide too much. Seek, seek some advice and uh, listen to what people are saying. You know, so you, so you can validate quickly that there is actually a quality problem out there. That, that that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And your mum doesn't count as a customer, sadly. Oh, my granny as well. God, here we go. She was so enthusiastic. <laughs> All right. Um, on, on that note, we might uh, move, move into part, part two now, which we've all been waiting for, which is where uh, you, the attendees, get to um, post, post your questions. I see that we've got a good, a good layer of questions uh, in here. Uh, if I can just encourage you, please, please do, as you are provoked by, you know, by, by like some of the questions, please feel free to put your, you know, put your questions into Q&A. Um, so they'll, they'll be addressed in turn. Okay, just another quick reminder. Um, I know that there are some people in the, in the audience who may be looking for next gig. So this is an opportunity for you to post in your, your URL. I think we've got um, Ankit Sobti, I think maybe in the audience. I don't know if you have already put, uh, put your, your URL in there or you've probably already been offered a job, I dare say. Um, so feel free to post into chat. Uh, you never know your luck. There, there could be somebody that's looking for somebody just like you. Okay, on that, uh, I might just pass over to uh, to Gerhardt so we can uh, we can get to Q and A. Uh, I know that you you actually had a um, had a question or two, a rather provocative question or two, Gerhardt. Well, I'll pass over to you. Yeah, I've saved my question to a bit later. I'll, I'll start with the audience questions because I know you might be very eager to get these answered. So. I'm going to start with a slightly provocative one, um, just because it's more fun. Uh, Delina Vo, and this one is to Danny. Um, Delina mentioned that you can a, a kettle in Kmart costs twenty bucks, but an IoT enabled kettle might cost you two hundred dollars, and this would be a big uh, a inhibitor for people wanting to adopt IoT. Uh, do you agree with this? And what do you see as the inhibitors in the IoT market? Yes, so that, that's a fantastic question. Um, obviously, um, people have got to be able to afford uh, devices. Um, somehow, most of us have got a $1,000 iPhone sitting in our pocket. So I don't think, um, you know, it's too difficult to justify when you really want something. Um, for that reason, I think we're seeing quite a lot of adoption, uh, and I actually don't know what the statistics would be in Australia at the moment. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, it's definitely not commonplace. Not everybody has a kettle that you can boil from sitting on the couch, but, but there's a few uh, tech-minded folks that do. I would say, though, I think this will mostly be driven by customer experience. So, you know, it's convenient to be able to do things off my smartphone or talk to the assistant who I can't name um, at, or, um, you know, my friend's got one, so I need to have one and that human behavior side of it. Um, of course, uh, the cost differential is not that big, but, um, you know, it's, it's not 20 bucks for a kettle. I think you're probably talking, say, 80 bucks 
do you, I mean, don't get me wrong, there are expensive ones out there. Um, but I think the cheapest smart kettles I've seen are 80 bucks and you can buy a regular kettle for 80 bucks. So um, I actually think there's more of an inhibitor around um, techie guys designing um, smart home products and people looking for that pretty kettle that goes with their toaster. I think that's actually more of a, um, a barrier in some cases than necessarily just cost. Um, though I, I do acknowledge that for some people it will be um, a barrier. Um, I still think it's mostly driven by human behavior and the convenience and, and experience. Um, but we do see um, other sectors. So for smart cities, for example, we do see that um, adding a sensor to a street light, for example, there is a cost associated and they need to sort of justify the benefit. Um, some of them use a similar thing like customer experience and how quickly they can repair the light because they now know it's broken uh, as a reason to do it. Um, I guess it's much the same as us in our personal lives, right? If you can justify doing it, you're happy to spend more money. Um, I would also, just for those of you who like the smart home thing and you don't want to spend 200 bucks on a kettle, you know, there's ways of doing it with smart plugs, which are quite a bit cheaper. So you don't have to go and buy a whole range of smart new devices. Though with a kettle example, you actually have to leave the switch down. So um, that's a bad example. But um, if it was a heater that you were turning on and off or something like that, um, being able to do that from a plug from your phone. Uh, I do that with my salt lamp in my bedroom, for example. It's not a smart salt lamp, it's just a regular one, um, but the plug itself is smart. So there's a few ways to go about that. Uh, but to answer the question, I think it will constrain some people, but um, you know, generally speaking, if people want it enough and get enough benefit, you're happy to pay for it like everything else in your life, I suppose. I'm, I might also add that um, from, from my perspective, it, it's, it's partly about getting ready for the coming trends. So if you look at the, the smart speaker that, that Danny can't talk about and the other one called Google Assistant, and you look at the trends on where Google is spending their money, where the other company is spending their money, Amazon is spending their money, they're, they're investing huge amounts of money to these, these smart devices to control your smart home. So if you talk about IoTs from a smart home perspective, that's what they're doing. And, and I think it's, it's quite interesting to um, see the wave of what will happen next. And, and I, I heard from an old colleague of mine um, you know, we've all seen, again, the story of, of, of kids swiping TVs when they see a screen, they come to it and try and swipe it. But um, her, her young child, which was around four, um, she had just bought a Google Home when, when it just first came out in Australia. And we were first to launch as partners with Google in what we were doing for the government. And, and um, her child walks into Woolies one day and hears the music and shouts out to Woolies, you know, out in the open, hey, hey, next song, please. And so, you know, that's, it's really sort of enlightening. And, and my child's first words were actually, hey, Google. Um, in my household, um, and and he used to scratch at the little device and trying to play with it. But but I think the interesting my my Google's just gone off actually. <laughs> um, and and it's just interesting from a trend perspective because um, if you think about what our children are going to be playing with and what they're going to be doing soon and how they're going to engage with technology, um, whether it's 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 a it's a bus stop. When I was working for transport, we're looking at smart bus bus stops and speakers for accessibility purposes. Um, talking to sensors down at your, your petrol station and so forth. It's like, how do you interact with these things? And partly it's about um, getting on board that, that trend that's going to come up soon in that area. And, and, and yes, you might say it doesn't make sense today, but um, you know, there was a short period of time where I couldn't put my child to bed without Google, like being able to put the lights out without having to get up out, out of bed. The, the accident, I have no hands to, to use because I'm holding a child. Um, that's like so great to have. Um, there are growing trends in that area. And if you look at Google, how they're doing search as well, you know, enabling search through the home device or your smartphone or your car as well, it, it's changing the whole marketing, um, how you reach customers. Like, you know, Google's going to recommend, if you say I'm hungry, Google's going to recommend you the nearest pizza shop. And how do you make sure as a business, your pizza shop is the one is recommended based on context, based on history, based on personalization, all that data that, that Google's collecting on you, it's going to recommend your particular pizza shop you as the other pizza shop, you're going to lose out in getting that business. And so it is getting on that trend and understanding it and, and shifting your business to suit. Dennis, there's another good point actually you mentioned then um, that I meant to mention before around, um, you know, smart devices. Um, obviously now if you buy a TV, most of the time they're going to come sort of smart pre-installed and you don't really pay much more for it. And, and obviously as these technologies become more pervasive, uh, the cost starts to come down. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's another good point um, that, that a lot of these things are more expensive than they'll probably ever be now, but they will continue to get cheaper um, 
you know, as, as the consumption increases. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great answers. So cool. So I'm going to move on to another question. Um, I don't know the name of the IP or LP. I'm not sure. Um, but I thought it was an interesting, provocative question. So I'll ask it. Um, and this, I'll go to Sarah here. Um, so uh, following on from the point that Sarah made about um, free courses, Coursera and all the, the, the I guess the, ch the cheaper options, um, are they recognized by the industries compared to conventional degrees? What's your opinion there? Um, well, you see, I'm gonna be honest with you, right? Like I don't, cause I didn't do, I can only really speak for myself here, but I personally think for security, there are other ways you can learn security other than other than having a degree. Um, I don't have a degree, but most people I know who work in security, who or at least have been in security for a number of years, don't have a security degree. Um, and so I don't think it's the be all and end all um, to to have that. I think it's much more important. I, and I'm not knocking having a cybersecurity degree. If you're in a space in your life where you can go and do a degree, you can afford it, blah, 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 blah. Then of course, go and do a degree. But I don't think, but I think a lot of people will discount themselves saying, well, I don't have a degree, so how could I do it? And honestly, if I just think about, you know, maybe my closest friends and colleagues in, uh, uh, in the industry, I don't think any of them have a degree that's specifically security. Some of them will have computer science degrees. Um, some of them have nothing or, or they'll have a degree in something else like me. So, you know, if, if you can do one, of course, go and do one. Um, if, if you are planning on doing a degree and you want to do security, you should go and do one. Um, are they recognized? I mean, I would never put on a job description. And again, I, I do not speak for my employer here, but I wouldn't put in a job description, I need a cybersecurity degree. I can teach you security. Um, I'm looking for your skills and your background and what else you've done. Because to be honest with you, it, it, and I don't know, I, I would love to hear what other people think because I think this is a wider thing than just security specifically. Like if I have 25 graduates who've all done the same cybersecurity course um, from, from whatever uni or, or a similar, how am I supposed to differentiate between you? In fact, what I'm looking for is other things to differentiate you because you've all done a degree. Um, now I'm not saying that certainly um, when it gets to someone like me, who's um, the actual more technical person, um, that would be fine. I mean, I'm not saying um, if recruiters, um, particularly recruiters who on just sort of doing a tick list are looking for certain, you know, certain things. And that's what employers say. I want X, Y, Z. I want X, Y, Z. Then yeah, you're probably more likely to maybe get screened out. And, and again, anyone else who's probably got more, even more experience than me, feel free to jump in when I finished. Um, but yeah, um, I don't think it's, it's tough. I know it's tough because I don't think there is a set qualification. It wouldn't be like, <clears throat> excuse me, okay, you have this, so I'm going to hire you. You're great. And, you know, I just look for well-rounded skills and, and people like going and putting themselves out there a bit. So, you know, if I get that sense from you, I'm, you're, I'm probably more likely to be drawn to you. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think I'm going around in circles now, so I'll stop, but yeah. Yeah. If you like, I can chime in here. It's, sure. it is, I think this is sort of my area of expertise. Uh, I might not have introduced myself in the beginning, I'm Gerhard, Director of Talent at Contino. I've probably hired over a thousand people in my career. So um, I think degrees are very good for getting your first job in the IT industry, uh, those graduate level uh, roles. Uh, beyond your first job, people more look at your experience rather than a degree. Um, I've seen lots of people get jobs based on getting their cloud certificates. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, people, they've gone and they've had an engineering qualification, they've got some system administration degree, and they've gone and got six AWS certs or six Azure certs or, or whatnot. And recruiters do get impressed by that. Um, if you go and get six or seven Amazon certs or six or seven Azure certs, that, that will uh, be impressive. And, and most of those certs are quite cheap if you compare that to a degree which costs you $75,000. Um, 
right? So if you can get your foot into a job uh, without a degree, you've, you've done well, um, but it, it, a degree will help you get your first job normally. So that's my analysis. Uh, with Coursera, there are certain things that they don't have degrees on. So I'll give you an example, SRE, it's a very new term. Um, I don't think there's a degree out there that SRE, but Coursera does have an SRE course. So, uh, and there are SRE jobs out there. And if you want to differentiate yourself, I, I think it could be a value. So yeah, I think horses for courses, but that's my analysis. Yeah, I would I would just add uh, my two cents to what Sarah said and what Ger Gerard said. I've been uh, interviewing folks for a better part of my career as well. And to be honest, these Coursera certificates or what the AWS certificates, as Gerhard mentioned, um, as such, what, what and I'll, I'll give you my thought process as well. When, when I go through a CV and if I see some of those mentioned on the CV, like I have these certificates, all it does is uh, to me, um, it sets a baseline or it sets a context. Okay, this person will know something about in these areas. Do I recognize that certificate for their job? It's not that, it's not that relatable, but yes, it does give me, okay, you know, I can differentiate you in these spaces. Um, an example could be in Coursera, if you do the, um, let's say the data structure courses, I know what that course does, or I might have an idea of what it would have taught you. So I know, I expect a certain, you know, uh, baseline of that uh, knowledge from you. So that is what it provides. Um, one thing that I've always mentioned to folks when I do my workshops or trainings, um, as Gera mentioned as well, certificates are very good uh, to you land that initial impression. But after that initial impression, it's, it's your experience. It's how you uh, translate that technology into value for an organization is what matters. Yeah, and just, uh, just to add to that, um, from my experience working with UTS students, particularly the last couple of years, um, the ones that are doing like computer science degrees, for example, and working in a startup and donating their time, like to the Sydney Hub here in Sydney, as Pete mentioned before, their soft skills are a lot higher once they finish their degree to go and talk to more senior people in an organisation to get a job. That's one thing I noticed that stands out above anything else. So it's, it's really learning those soft skills and having the ability to challenge and participate in collaborative conversations as early as possible. And then you get that confidence to come up and it comes up in interviews also. And I do notice a difference in that type of um, maturity. The ones who just do the degree, who just focus on that and get tunnel vision and then don't do anything else on the side. Um, and especially in the summertime too, donate some time in summer, right? When you're doing part-time work. So yeah, just think about the soft skills that you get outside. That's the big one I'd like to call out. Yeah. Just one thing I was just going to add was that um, nowadays you don't need to go the traditional route of um, getting a degree. So, for example, um, Udacity do the nano degree, which is sponsored by industry experts like, you know, Google, um, Tableau, and they do those in the fields of cloud, AI, data, etc., um, and they're real life projects that they get you to work on. So um, that's another route um, that you can go through as well. Um, and because they're sponsored by these different companies and they're set in real life projects, it does help you also to um, get a job afterwards as well. So um, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat, um, but the Udacity Nano degrees are, are becoming uh, much more uh, popular. And uh, by the way, I did have a number of questions for Pete Cooper, but you did a fantastic job answering a lot of them in the Q&A chat. Um, so if anybody's interested in a lot of the um, questions and answers, you can also look at the Q&A in the answered section. Um, and I think on the chat as well. Um, so thanks thanks for that, Pete. Uh, yeah. Um, I, I guess a, a question that I had, okay, I'll, we'll go for the controversial one to Michael Hamilton. Um, the one that we prepared earlier. Um, so let, let's say uh, you go and seek data, a few thousand jobs available, uh, cloud DevOps, there's a few thousand jobs available, security, there's a few thousand jobs available. You go to blockchain and there's 33 jobs. Um, can be disheartening for someone trying to get into that industry where hey, I can choose one of these other sectors that got thousands of jobs and blockchain only has 33 jobs. Uh, what, what would you say to that and, and how would you answer? Whether yeah, that, yeah. That's a good question, particularly from an Australian point of view, definitely. Um, 
One thing I've noticed is because it's a lot of private networks are sucking in the good developers, I'm finding, all the people who need to participate in those type of uh, blockchain projects. And a lot of the investments coming from Asia, as I mentioned in China and um, the US, particularly around it, they're dominating that. So they're getting a lot of remote people working and not advertising. They don't need to. They pull them out of networks and specialised areas. Now, for example, digital assets involved with the Australian Stock Exchange settlement project at the moment, back-end settlement process. Now, they brought their company over here as a vendor from overseas to here with their skill sets, for example, because they weren't here necessarily in the Australian market. Now, um, lot, that's probably what you don't, why you don't see a lot of that. But also, the other side of the coin is that it's not a good indicator of if the industry is an emerging one. Now, as I mentioned, there's been a lot of money invested in the industry to seed a lot of these companies. That will start ramping up into jobs very soon and also working remotely also. But also, um, a lot of the companies just go to the open source communities. They go to these open projects like these crypto projects like Ethereum networks and they just ask them questions and post on those forums as I mentioned earlier, and making sure you're exposed to those forums and on those projects, make sure you can get a job. Um, they'll look for there. So I'm finding less traditional methods of advertising and putting on job posts on the traditional websites is not really the effective way a lot of these people are trying to find the right skill sets. So yeah, sticking outside the square. And um, we also looked, and I think Dennis mentioned also many years ago that it was, there was the same case for AI. There wasn't as many um, jobs there too, right? At the same starting point. And years later, look at it now. Look at DevOps 10 years ago. So, yeah, Dennis, what, what do you reckon, mate? What, what do you reckon your thoughts on what your experiences were there? Yeah, I think um, for, for my, my journey again to almost two decades in this space, I actually used to teach uh, the course on conversational design as well, just a slight UX. It's been on some of the AI stuff. And, and um, you know, when, when I spoke with a lecturer who, who was organizing, it's like, well, how many jobs do we think are in the industry after this? happens and it's kind of like there weren't enough jobs to to facilitate running the course so we actually killed the course at the end of the day lo and behold you know two decades later it's a popular thing now so um i, I think one one angle is is it's about passions and interests like everyone here talking to you today has a passion and interest in this field i think if you find one then you'll find the work that you do in that area is, is rewarding of its own it's, it's it's exciting it's interesting and so i think pick an area that you you find of interest uh, and go down that path, not necessarily just trying to follow the money, because otherwise you might be doing something that has high volume, that you're competing with a whole bunch of other people and you have no interest. So I think as Pete mentioned before, I think find your passions. And I've been lucky to follow that and, and been looked after in that particular area. But, you know, you look at, you know, the stats around, around AI as well. Uh, as again, I mentioned CSIRO put out a report saying um, there's a, a shortage of a, a need for new AI specialists of 161,000 um, you know, AI specialists needed by 2030. So, so where are those people going to come from if everyone's doing, you know, digital transformation, AI this, AI that? Where are all the skills going to come from? They don't exist today. There's not necessarily uh, degrees skilled in the area of um, AI, but you can do a whole bunch of courses in that area. So for me, you know, can we compete with China? Can we compete with the US? And, and will they commoditize particular AI aspects, like if there's going to be a quoting system for insurance or a, a claims processing thing built by someone, can you, can you outdo what's happening in the US and China? Possibly, possibly not. But I think, you know, the application for business purposes within Australia, I think is where the skills gap is, how, how to apply the technologies that you hear about today into Australian businesses and make them succeed faster. So I, I do like to, to use the analogy of, um, you know, it, it's sometimes better to be the, sh the, the, the chef of a restaurant who knows how to use all the different utensils and the ovens and the microwaves, et cetera, and not just be the person that's niched on building microwaves. So I guess, you know, partly find the niche you're interested in, your passion, go down that path, and, and don't be disheartened by, by low stats because if you look at where the trends are going, Hopefully you hear a lot of that today. You can pick the direction and it's something you're interested in and super passionate about. Thanks for that. Um, so the next question is for Davinia. Um, so I'm a data analyst, data scientist, um, and I'm trying to break into the industry. Is there any advice uh, that you can give me? Um, I would say to look at the grad programs that a lot of companies um, have. Um, to get, um, you know, onto the grad programs or, um, or an internship 
um, that's a good way to get some experience and get your um, foot in the door because it's all about getting you know your first break to get your foot in the door and once you're in there then it's easier to um, you know stay there and and then you know get more um, experience um, so that would really be my my advice um, to yes yeah, have a look and see um, you know on LinkedIn on seek you know the different um, graduate and internship programs um, that are there um, because once you get your foot in the door it's then easier to then um, keep on keep on going from there and get some real life experience great I did have a question before um, from Ankit Sobti um, not directed at any specific panelists so anybody can put their hand up for this one um, I see collaboration of the several domains, including data, AI, security, cloud, IoT, and other also DevOps. So in terms of skill set, what are the common challenges you face when you see overlap of domains? Um, do you think there is a requirement of expertise in multiple domains? Uh, what do you think will be the trend in the future? Pratik, you wanna take this one? Oh, he wanted to, Danny. I think this is sort of crossing into the air or well, the the area of what they're calling like t-shaped engineers uh whereby you know you may be pr primarily based in the in in um, automation and uh, the you know we're looking for sort of opportunities by which you can learn ju just enough information in one of the other areas to be a bit dangerous you know so obviously um, automation and security go hand in hand but you know as a good sort of data person you need to know about um, automation to be able to take your take your data tool bag with you. So, is there uh, are we seeing a bit of a trend that uh, it's been beneficial for people to become more of a T-shaped engineer, as in to specialize, get good at one thing, but also to remain re reasonably horizontal as well? Any takers on that one? Danny. Yes. So, Stephen, I can I can provide a bit of context at least uh, for for our organisation. Um, we obviously specialise in the IT space, um, but I would I would say that um, I, I'm certainly not recommending everyone go out and be a generalist um, because obviously you still need people who are specialised in areas. So I'll, I'll say that first. I'm not saying focus on everything. Um, I like to think you need to know enough to be dangerous in a few areas, um, and you know you might have one or two passion areas that are your thing. Um, I absolutely think that, um, you know, if you're too broad, you end up really shallow across the skills that you have. And I think that it's important that people become, um, you know, practitioners and really uh, own the domain that they work in. Um, but I would be lying if I said that all I do is IoT. Um, you know, on a, on a daily basis, I'm talking, you know, AI and or machine learning, you know, data visualization, end user experience, you know, UX, UI, I'm, I'm not saying I'm an expert in all these things, by the way, um, you know, but you, you touch on different areas, um, the cloud space more broadly, and of course, um, security. Um, the way we deal with it in our organization is we obviously have people who specialize. Um, we encourage everyone to be generalized across a few different areas and cross skill because we find it really hard. Um, a few people were saying before around either trying to find niche skill sets or find niche roles. So, um, you know, we very rarely find someone who has all of the skills that we want, but um, we can find enough to be able to cross skill within our team. So uh, it takes a bit of effort, especially in the emerging space, but, um, you know, we find that formula works really well for us. Um, and to sort of echo what Michael was saying before, we, we nearly always hire out of networks, out of our intern program, we host a lot of our master's students um, as, as one of their sort of capstone projects. Um, we get to keep a few of those, um, you know, if we're in the right cycle of our growth. Um, and when, when we can't, we can, we can help them uh, with our, our network to, to other roles. So, um, yeah, I, I would say definitely broadly skilling and also the specialising. I don't, I don't think anyone who's a generalist and everything um, is particularly easy to place uh, and I don't know if the recruiters on, on the, the panel here can provide much more context from your perspective on that. 
Yeah, I, I could actually yeah, I could actually add to that. Um, for, for my perspective, because we're storing lots of data in a database um, across different disciplines within blockchain, and that database is getting bigger. And as I mentioned earlier, talking to people like Dennis, I need to talk to him and get some feedback on how to use it, and also Davina, for example. So for me, it's having the skill sets of the blockchain and the information of the analytics skills, but also having the design skills to understand how to inter interact with someone like Sarah from a security point of view, right, to secure the data um, from that point of view. And also working with Danny, someone like Danny's organisation on IoT when it comes to agriculture on the blockchain and how to interact and grab all that data through also. They don't necessarily have to be a developer and know how to code and do all that stuff, but they need, if we decide to outsource that work, I need someone on staff or in the future who has the design capabilities and concepts to in, engage with that developer. So therefore, it reduces costs down, but also... Um, I can get half the work done in-house and then the other half I can outsource but still, you know, balance up the costs. But, yeah, design concepts are very important to understand in other disciplines outside your own so you can at least have a conversation with other people about yeah. those things you need done. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, and, uh, the last thing I would like to add is, and I agree with all the panelists, like it's, it's more of a, you know, D-shaped kind of a situation where you need to know about other things but specialise in yours. And I'll give you a concrete example. Recently, we were trying to do soil uh, moisture IoT devices in the backyard. Um, and and I, I didn't know anything about IoT. All I know is cloud and DevOps. And if <laughs> all I can do is make magic happen in the cloud. Uh, but then uh, my brother who knows more about these IoT, stuff, IoT devices, he understands how to place them and how to collect that data, but then transport of that data into the cloud, processing of data into that from that cloud and producing some uh, results as to maybe alerts or maybe just a dashboard of how things are, is where these cross skilling uh, cross skills come into play. Like you can't just, one person can't just know everything. So you can't be an expert. And that I think would be a bad expectation anyway. So as all the panelists have said, you need to know broadly how you can do certain things because you can tap into experts into different fields, but in your field, you need to specialize. So when you pick a field, that's where you, you know, go deep as, as, as Stephen put it, a T-shaped um, engineer or person. Excellent. Um, so I might ask a question for P. Cooper. I know he's answered a few of the ones already in the panel, but um, I have a pre-prepared question about startups and the pandemic. Um, what do you think? Oh, the, yeah. The yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. Um, has had yeah, on look, it's pretty like, um, okay, so you, I'm assuming everyone looks at the, the data, right, occasionally, and, and you can't avoid the newspaper articles, but... The um, the new cases um, data. If you look at the rolling three seven year seven day numbers, the the time to doubling is collapsing from eight six five and and rapidly heading to four weeks. So new cases doubling. Right now, okay, they're not dying as much uh, on a compared to new cases data, and maybe a lot of things that are not new cases are not. Um, actually COVID or they, there's a sort of like a perverse incentive to re report them as COVID. But regardless, that the, those numbers are driving the lockdowns, right? And the rolling lockdowns and the perception of waves and the actual waves, right? I'm not denying that there's a, a global pandemic by any means. Um, so here we've, we've had a military, in Burma, we've had a military dictatorship for 50 years. I'm from Sydney originally and can see the contrast in the way of developing and developing countries are responding probably more starkly than most and um, people are desperate and in, in both in developing and developed countries and and so the paths to create jobs um, uh, you know in, in my consulting you know industry um, network it's divided hard into three categories so you've got the traditional industries which were always in the bottom end and they were going to gradually get hurt the the progressive ones uh which were going ahead um but now there's this sort of third middle category which is all the ones that were mildly progressive but not using tech and remote working and, and digital uh properly uh, and that includes iot and city cities and data and you know ai the whole the whole lot of the progressive tool sets so what's happening is um the the ones that were dying or drifting away gradually are dying much faster 
the ones that are the ones that have got some progressive nature they sort of they, they call it the split economy in australia the, the you know the, the two economies it's really three now and and then there's ones that are actually exploding like e-commerce and you know remote working and 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 they they're going faster than anything's ever gone before and I, I include a lot of the cloud growth and the um, intelligent layers on top of the cloud, the services, the AI services. Um, so so um, the, the thing about those ones is they're available to everyone and, and they're also competing very aggressively. So they're still largely free. Look at the tools we're using today for this conference. So the developing countries that previously were at a structural disadvantage, the, the, their, their structural disadvantages are being smashed. Right? So their ability to comp compete with developed countries and the capital required to do so is being, you know, uh, uh, just torn away rapidly daily. So, and then the, the, the only constraining uh, uh, metric is, is that they, they're not hyper-connected and peer learning enough for everyone to learn. But in Myanmar, 90% of people have got phones and 90% of people on Facebook. So th th they're learning about new stuff you know, in minutes. So, and, and I think this is being played out all over the world. So we're going to, we're going to see, we're going to see a completely different set of, you know, um, co competitive economies um, evolve really. Uh, and and, and we, we've got to think much more again about remote work uh, and using global resources. Um, and if we're not doing it for every role and every decision in every team and every startup and every enterprise, you're not doing your job. It's that simple. Excellent. Cool. Um, so next question I have is for Sarah. Um, how do you see automation and ML helping with cloud security? Oh my God, big questions, but good question. Um, a lot. So automation and ML are things that we're probably not super good at using yet. I still think it's in early days, but definitely as, as we scale things up in the cloud um, in order to manage things and get them working properly, um, and actually be able to keep security going quite well. We have to take people out of it as much as possible because, you know, people, people are unreliable and don't always do things right or quickly or consistently. And so this isn't about getting rid of jobs and, and automating out people because what we need is to automate all the stuff that is straightforward, that is repeatable, that we've seen again and again and again, and leave the people to look at the interesting things. Because uh, there's, there's research that shows, I can't remember where it's from, that something like 45% of alerts uh, in, in uh, and, and complex environments never get looked at ever and that's because we just don't have enough people and the way to solve this is to not just hire more people because that we, we can't get enough people anyway there's not enough security people out there anyway there's a skill shortage but it, the thing we should be doing is automating away the easy repeatable things that come up time and time again and that's how we're going to scale um and the same um i've said automation a lot but also machine learning comes into this as well so that that's where I see the the real advantages from a security perspective. But I, I we've got a long way to go. I don't think we're there yet. Cool. Sorry, I might just jump in and apologies for jumping in every single time when Sarah has something because I feel like cloud and security work so hand in hand. Um, but I'll put a very uh, quick example here is recently uh, we were working, um, I was helping an organization. It was a two or three days thing that I was just working with them and what we, um, they developed was on certain policy basis um, on cloud. Uh, there were there were things we what we termed as uh, nannies, if you will, um, and they were just looking after your uh, after your cloud infrastructure. And what they were doing was um, looking at your logs and looking at your monitoring systems and looking at your observability systems. They were just constantly learning as to what are your good, not good, but what is a violation look like. And depending on that violation factor, they started adding to the policies. Now, in some cases, we did start to plug holes which were not meant to plug, and that actually stopped public traffic. But that's the gap where we need to evolve our learning engine so that they can detect what's right, what's wrong, and improve on that. But I think security and cloud can benefit a lot from ML being plugged into our usual monitoring logging systems. I don't know if that adds anybody, but I thought I'll just give that two cents. 
And I might move to Dennis now. It's a good segue, the whole AI conversation. What are some of the common misconceptions? And, and I, I can think of one that is talked about a lot, AI and the elimination of jobs, right? So I think mm -hmm. Sarah touched upon it. What's, what, what, do you, what do you think about that? And um, what do you think about AI and, and that viewpoint? Yeah, so, so there is um, a lot of talk about, about jobs disappearing due to AI. And you, know, you look at customer service related activities or even like the data type things. Um, but I, I think when it comes down to it, as, as Sarah pointed out, there's um, a lack of, of skilled people that can do skilled work and that it can allow a company to scale. So there's a whole bunch of stuff companies don't do simply because they're spending time and effort labor doing the, the really basic and repeatable stuff. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that slips through the cracks so they don't have time. And, and that for me is where I guess the myth of, of, of job loss partly lies is, is that it really should be about reskilling. You know, yes, you might be in a particular role if you're a sysadmin that looks at logs day to day, day to day and looking for alarms. Your job may be reduced a little bit with um, a sort of machine learning thing that says, hey, these thresholds have been hit. And if it goes over this much of a change, then that means it's, it's, it's red alarm bells ringing. So yes, that job kind of changes a bit, but you know, there's your opportunity to reskill and say, how do I get onto this AI um, bandwagon, reskill a tiny bit and, and start applying business towards you know, outcomes for that particular alarm or the area that I'm working in. And so for me, a lot of it is about that education reskilling aspect so that that myth disappears. And when we rolled out these AI solutions in, in organizations, it's never about job loss. And, you know, we get the people involved into the technology. Um, it's, it's about reskilling them. So, you know, your best assets for a company to, are to keep your same people that understand the business as well. And there's a whole raft of skills that they can reskill towards, um, not just um, with, with, you know, grunt work, basically. Um, there are topics that weren't discussed today around the robotics process automation area, a, a whole bunch of like accounting jobs and, and, and just manual processing jobs will be disappearing as well. But it's like, how do those people reskill with the, the things they're good at into the, the new marketplace there afterwards? Um, in terms of, I guess, other misconceptions, there's a lot of people thinking or executives thinking that, that AI is a bit of a silver bullet to, to get the job done, but then they don't realize that there's actually a lot of work that goes in, into building an AI model, the training of the data, the massaging of all that data, the sourcing of it, making sure um, it has no biases, uh, that the data is fair, it's evenly captured. And then there's this whole testing and, and, and liveness with the data. As time goes on, um, you find new cases the data didn't uh, cater for, didn't train for. And so costs also start to blow out around AI in thinking it's a silver bullet and it's gonna be 100% accurate, it's, it's not. And it's often based on the data you have uh, collated to train the models with. Um, and so I see two things happening, two myths is there are people that believe AI will solve all their problems. And I see the myth of others then saying, oh, this AI model doesn't work that well, but we're happy with 60% accuracy. Um, and, and that to me is, um, I guess, people that don't understand AI well enough and how to improve it them telling the business again, oh, look, you know, 60% automation is better than nothing. Let's, let's stick with that. And that to me is a, a quite a bit of a shame to, to say, look, we've implemented automation, but it's not working that well. Um, there are certainly things you can do to improve that. And so that's where I think the skills gap is um, in the retraining, you know, but um, there's nothing like getting your hands on a real data set and, and solving a real business problem. And as I said before, you know, look at your business, where you work, uh, pick a scenario, uh, look for free data and actually try something out. You know, in, in doing that exercise, you'll learn a huge amount. Oh, thanks for that. Um, Danny, I do have a question from the audience, um, from Chris. What are some of the best IoT examples or potential um, IoT solutions that you, you want to see or have seen in the financial services industry? Um, in financial services. Um, I, I must admit I don't work a huge amount in financial services, but um, I guess probably the the most obvious ones um, are sort of in your, your wearable space. Um, so, you know, I, I guess it also depends on whose definition you take for IoT um, in terms of, um, you know, being able to pay with different types of devices, be it, you know, smart rings, watches, um, smart cards that can hold multiple credit cards. There's quite a few of those. Um, you know, even even um, the interactions, I suppose, with our phone. 
I've also seen a guy um, who's implanted like a chip in his hand to, to do stuff that he would normally do with a plastic card. Um, so I had a chat with a guy in the US who's got one in each hand for his car and his house. Um, it's a bit far for me, but um, I, I recommend, you know, like, I um, quite admire his uh, commitment to um, his cyborg life, as he calls it. Um, I think the other obvious things are things like ATMs are probably some of the oldest examples of, of, of IoT um, in terms of, you know, machine to machine communication, um, which is kind of rolled into IoT these days. Um, I don't know of a huge amount, though, that there's also things like uh, the use of Bluetooth beacons in banks and financial services to understand um, who comes and goes, how often somebody comes in, the customer loyalty side of it. But but just in that example, just the Bluetooth example, we're talking about um, you know IoT. We're talking about data analytics. We're talking about matching that data back to other systems. Um, you know, be be that cloud or other areas. So that, like that's that's an example, I suppose, where it bounces between all of those things. And of course. We're dealing with um, customer data, so we're also talking about security, um, and, and we may or may not be, be talking about analytics and, and blockchain in that example. But you know, it's a really simple example of being able to walk into a store and then know and be able to greet you because you're a VIP because they've kind of got that integration of a few different um, technology blocks, um, and that example does exist, especially in things like car dealerships when you walk in. I know we're talking about financial services, but um, it is quite pervasive in, in some sectors already and high-end um, shops. Um, but yeah, in, in financial services, it, I'm seeing most of it lately around payment. Um, though the, there's probably a whole gamut of examples. It's, it's not a world I play in very often, and I'm sure it's a um, whole of its own. Though actually one also comes to mind, the um, Frank Green Cups have got uh, payment chips in them. So you load your um, cup with say hundred bucks, you go to your coffee shop and you just swipe your cup. Um, that's an example, it's, it's not that old, but I already think that smartphones and being able to pay with your phone has already sort of leapfrogged that convenience factor of those cups. So um, it's moving pretty quick as well. I'm just gonna Can go. I just might add as well, like um, IoT for financial services or, or e-commerce is an interesting thing, but um, there's also an increasing area with AI and, and vision happening um, as, as you walk through shops, they, they scan your face and, and who you are and know a bit about you. Um, and, and, you know, there are, there are interesting folk down in Melbourne um, from car sales doing, doing work with, um, with cars on, on toll roads, you know, knowing what type of vehicles are going past and, you know, potentially looking at changing banners on a digital billboard 500 meters down the road. So um, it doesn't have to be necessarily IoT, like physical devices or, or chips implanted in various places or in different um, objects, but also AI with vision is also taking a massive um, chunk out of that yeah. in terms of tailoring experiences. Yeah, if I can, if I can add to that. Um, so you, you, you've seen the Amazon Go stores in the US, right? Where you, get, you walk in, you pick up your product and you don't, you, you, you pay with it. Right, so that, that stuff is, is very cool. And I thought it was relatively expensive, but we've actually just done, we just built one in, in Myanmar um, and it's using, using commoditized, what is now very, very, very commoditized technology. And it's integrated with that e-wallet app I was telling you about before that 6 million people have. So, um, and, and as a side product of that is they, they can tell you your route through the store. So we went in there with three of us and tried to goof around and confuse the algorithm and pass products around and put them back down in the wrong place. And, didn't swipe them and, you know, one person paid and then they cancelled part of the transaction and really, like, you know, really tested this thing out and it was 100% right. Um, and so so here we are with a, a country with a GDP of, you know, 150th per capita of Australia uh, using the stuff that, um, you know, our richest, our richest allies have got. So, yeah, it's, it's just happening so quickly. Cool. I'm, I'm just mindful of time. Um, and I know there's lots of questions that might, may or may not have been answered and apologies for trying to get through as many as possible. Um, one for Davinia, then one for Michael, and then we'll, we'll, we'll call it a, a night. So Davinia, um, what do you think is the biggest change that you've seen in the data field in the last five to 10 years? I think the biggest change is probably seeing the, um, the use of, of data just exponentially keep on growing uh, because it's, it's to do anything um, 
meaningful nowadays and to get insight you need to mine data and it's just continuing to grow um but also i've seen the the wrong side of how data can be used also grow um everyone's obviously familiar with cambridge um, analytica as 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 a prime example um so that's what i would say i've probably seen the biggest change of how important data has become um, for companies to um, mine the data, understand the data, but use it in a in a uh, ethical way. Awesome, thanks, Davinia. And and Michael, last question. This this one's from um, LP again, and I thought it was quite interesting because a few people might be interested in this. Um, you highlighted the importance of soft skills, and I I actually agree with that a lot. Um, how do you effectively promote these soft skills in your resume? Very good question. I, I, I read that also, I've thought of that before. He, why you also do that, not just on the resume, but also get involved with the marketing of the business that you're in, when I was talking about the startup before. You might join in with some uh, social media posts and contribute with the owner of that business to some thoughts on your, your thoughts on industry, right? And showing your face on, on, on proactively getting involved in that way. That could be another way of selling your skills and showing how you can promote the business just outside your technology skill sets. That's one way of doing it. Um, also, maybe submitting um, white papers, information back to the, um, if you are participating in online projects, like an open source projects, as I mentioned, make sure that that's front of mind in your CV, for example, and showing that you're kind of participating in things outside of your normal work, right? Um, but I think getting that kind of that public face on there, I, I think that's huge. And I know a lot of a lot of the uh, guys I've worked with, the startups and the young guys I get from UTS, I get them on video. I get them on the screen and I force them to do it just to get their confidence up. And um, and I notice they do get work and I'll be able to place them work elsewhere and get them jobs um, from doing that. So, yeah, just, just get outside your comfort zone. That's what I recommend. If I could just comment just very, very briefly there. It's really important to be to try and find a safe environment where you can learn this as well, because obviously standing up with you know with a microphone speaking to people is not everybody's uh, ideal dream. I think most people would prefer to visit their own funeral you know than speak in front of a group of people. But that's <laughs> something that we can help with at Meta Madness. Like if you just get in touch, uh, we're all, we're all over that. We've we've organised a, a lot of these events before, and we can help you, uh, whether it be privately perhaps sort of one-on-one -on -one, or to try and help you to get on to doing maybe one of your first talks to share a bit of a story. So like, get in touch and uh, let's talk. And I thought I'd just quickly chime in on this one again, just because I've seen lots and lots and lots of CVs. Um, I find that there's some people on their CVs, they very extremely specific on the years of technical skills, like 2.3 years of this and 2.7 years of that and 3.9 years of that and it's I, and I don't understand how they're able to I don't know if they auto updates every month that goes past where it goes to 3.11 or whatever it is right um, it, uh, that whenever I see that I immediately don't see a human um, so my my advice would be the first paragraph in your CV write something that will create an emotive connection with the person reading it and yourself. Not too long, because then it looks like a novel and then they can't get to the meat because people do want to see your experience too. But a one paragraph that is has some type of connection uh, and people see you as a human. Um, uh, but yeah, obviously the skills are important. Put your skills. I'm not saying don't put it. Uh, that people, recruiters definitely look at that. But I, I wouldn't go as granular as 2.7 um, years two and a half or three or round it up or is, is fine. <laughs> yeah. Make sure that you've uh, that, that, you know, that you've also read one of about a million books like Dale Carnegie's How to Win Friends and Influence People, written in like the 1950s or something like that, still is relevant today, and it's top to tail with all the soft skills that you'll ever need. <laughs> Exactly. It's also good. It's also good to have an opinion in the industry too to demonstrate what your thoughts are, you know, and that that also shows maturity, you know, things like that, and yeah, have an opinion, have some insights, and you know, things like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. right. do, do we have any other questions? I think given we're, we've already gone ten minutes over time, so I'm sure some people here want, 
might some of the panelists might want to have their dinner or see their family. So um, unless there's any final burning comments from any of the panelists that they need to say that they didn't have the opportunity to say, speak now or forever hold your peace. There you go, Pratik. We should I do. As or always. until the next session. <laughs> <laughs> No, I do as always, uh, I have more things to talk about these things, but what I would like to uh, wrap this up with is, and I think this is this might be applicable to all the domains as well. Uh, one of the biggest challenges that I've seen while, while taking people through workshops and courses on client DevOps is um, that initial inhibition um, around, oh, I can't, I can't understand this or this is too complicated for me. Just sometimes I know that initial inhibition is a big blocker, but try to find people who can help you out with that. Like in our industry, even in like Melbourne and Sydney, there are many community leaders who are running open free workshops or who are doing meetups and things like that. Just try to attend those and come to one of these. And if you're looking to start in, in the industry, want to go down the DevOps or cloud path, just come to one of the meetups and listen to um, one of the community leaders. Or even if you any of your folks have any questions, reach out on LinkedIn. I'm always, always happy to help with those kind of things. That's it. I think I might go without saying that uh, for all the panelists here, you know, if you have questions, reach out to us over LinkedIn or the, or the links were shared in the, the chat window earlier. We're always happy to help. Awesome. All right. So I think just in, just in summary, before we, before we clock off, so to speak, uh, what an awesome, what an awesome kickoff event. I mean, um, quality of panelists, the quality of questions that we've had has just been amazing. Uh, so I think just sort of in summary, I think uh, that we're trying to sort of encourage people to do a little bit of research when it comes to the emerging techs. Uh, don't get, get out of your comfort zone, as in it's all too easy just to focus on what you're doing and you know, get into your slippers, get your hot cup of tea, and just not get out of your comfort zone to learn about some new stuff. So it helps it, it, if you connect up with um, communities, perhaps to do this, whether it be via like meetup.com or one of the startup sort of incubators, perhaps hang around about there. Um, also, I think I heard that it's a good idea to make sure that you research the data. Data is not, is not for everybody, but I think it's important uh, that you need to understand where, where the money is you know, when it comes to, you know, these emerging technologies as well, just so you can make more balanced decisions. Um, we organize a whole bunch of these meetups. I've been kicking around the concept of uh, creating uh, some events to, or some webinars or whatever to cover off some soft skills. Uh, I think that, that there's definitely an increasing need for it. So you can watch out for that one. If you want to follow us um, at, at Meetup Madness, uh, we'll certainly make sure that we uh, keep, keep you aware of the next events. As far as the next steps go, um, keep, your, keep your eyes peeled. We've got the, the next Fireside event. Uh, we've got it no notionally penciled in for another month's time, and we're going to have, uh, this time it's going to be focused around Something that we touched upon tonight, but we're really going to dig in, and it's around employment. So we're going to get some real uh, recruitment powerhouses uh, to be able to sit in and give us some advice on what on what their um, their vision is, what you know, what what they have seen uh, with regards to the cyclical nature of um, skills. So I hope that you're going to join us for that one as well. Uh, what else have we got here? Oh, just to say thank, uh, thank you very, very much once again, not only to all of our panelists, you ladies and gentlemen, absolutely rock. Uh, there's a bit of an army of people in behind the scenes who have helped to pull, pull this together. So I credit all of you, the Brads, the Natalias. Uh, Mike, Mike has been really, really helpful at helping to pull this together. And of course, the good guys at Contino, especially Gerhardt. Uh, he's been, as always, um, super fantastic. A big thank you very much uh, w once again. I don't know if Joey has still got his eyes open from Linode. Uh, <laughs> th thank you very much. Uh, Jasper from Infobox and, and Jali from um, Instacluster. Uh, you can look out for <coughs> some uh, events that we're going to be organizing with those guys uh, to try and help you a bit more in the tech verticals that you're interested in. 
Uh, we're going to be organizing some uh, wor workshops coming up as well, so I'm looking forward to that as well. So unless we've got um, any, other, um, any other questions, I think, ladies and gentlemen, we shall call it. That's a wrap. We should, say, we should say thank you to, to you, Stephen, and to Gerhard for making it all happen. Uh, really, really great work with Meetup Madness. And um, yeah, it's, you're you. doing some wonderful work, mate. Keep it up. Yeah, good work, guys. Well done. Good work. Awesome. Thank you very much, ladies and gents. We shall see you Thanks, again. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Evening. Bye.